All right. Looks like we are live and I want to welcome everybody to Standing for Truth. My name is Donnie and I am your host and moderator for tonight's debate on soteriology or the doctrine of salvation. It is a privilege to have two true professionals, two experienced debaters on this topic, Travis Thomas and Charles Jennings here with me to debate this important topic. The question we are specifically debating tonight is, what is true biblical salvation, free grace theology or lordship salvation? It is a privilege, again, to have Charles from the Layman Seminary and Travis from Truth With Proof. Both of these gentlemen always come uh, swinging and well prepped for these kinds of debates. So why don't we kind of uh, break the ice a little bit? We've got a new face here with Travis. Travis, it's, it's always a pleasure to have uh, new debaters here on the platform. And so why don't we start with you in terms of an introduction, a little bit about yourself and also a little bit about your uh, ministry. Yeah. Well, as you, you guys can see, my name, of course, is Travis Thomas. I am a gospel preacher. Um, been preaching, started preaching probably when I, since I was uh, turned 33. I do uh, online uh, YouTube live call-in broadcast called Truth with Proof on YouTube. I would encourage you guys to go check that out. Um, I'm married. I have three children, and I live in Middle Tennessee area. Also, on my broadcast, you can see uh, my phone number, my personal phone number. I give my phone number out because I feel like if people are really seeking truth and they have Bible questions, that they can actually call me when I'm not even on the air, and we can just talk about uh, what the Bible says. So that's pretty much me and I'm summed up. Travis, well, I appreciate that. That's very cool. And so if anybody wants to see more from both our debaters, uh, including Travis Thomas, please do check the description box of this video where you'll find uh, the relevant links to their channels. Charles from the Layman's Seminary, good to have you back as well. How have you been? Uh, and a little bit about uh, you and, and the Layman's Seminary. Well, uh, I didn't shave because I didn't want to shave time off my debate prepar uh, preparation. <laughs> I'm I'm the war machine coming out of quarantine because I, you know, uh, I'm off my steroids for COVID. And, and so here I am. But uh, the layman seminary, the mission statement for it is teaching Christians how to study and share their Bible with others. My wife, who's a Filipino that's in the Philippines right now, we're working on that process. Uh, she's my constant companion and, and she's in my debate preparation videos and studying and things like that. And she'll be in the chat interacting with y'all and she's way more passionate than me. Um, but anyway, so yeah, um, looking forward to this. This is a closest thing I have to peer review. I have some ideas and theories that I'm actually doing internal critiques again with my own position. And I'm trying to see how it relates to other positions for its explanatory power. So that's one reason I'm here because it supports the ministry of the layman seminary. Cause I believe everybody should have access to seminary training if they want it. Charles, thank you so much for that uh, introduction. It's good to see that you're starting to uh, feel a lot better and I've seen you both uh, debate of course. And so I can assure the audience, this will be an epic showdown, a very professional and also a scholarly exchange. Again, the title for tonight is Lordship Salvation or Free Grace Theology. What is true biblical salvation? Real quick, I wanna remind the audience that this week one could say is the Soteriology Showdown Week. So uh, last night we had John Crawford and Merritt this was a salvation debate specifically. What is the proper understanding of John 15? So if you have not yet seen that, please do check it out. Tonight, of course, this one has been a much anticipated debate. A lot of people, including myself, have, have wanted to see this one. Travis Thomas and Charles Jennings. And then uh, typically we have Sundays off. So we will be back here on Monday for another soteriology debate. So this time, Turretin fan and Eli Haytov. Same question, what is true biblical salvation? So for all of uh, those debate addicts out there that love this topic the most, this is a four-day event you definitely don't want to miss. So for the audience's sake, let's go over the format for tonight. So we've got ourselves a formal debate with 15-minute opening statements, 
Charles Jennings is going to be uh, kicking us off with his opening statement. Then we're going to have 10-minute uninterrupted rebuttals, followed by lots of uh, discussion time. So everybody's favorite part of these debates, 50 minutes of discussion. And we're going to break those up into two sections. So 25 minutes where debater A can lead the way. And then 25 minutes where debater uh, B will lead the way asking questions. Then we'll have a five minute uh, concluding statement. Debaters can wrap up their thoughts and points. And then this is where we get you guys in the audience involved. We'll have a roughly 25 minute uh, Q&A period. And so please, if you have a question, let's keep it on topic, of course. Make sure you're tagging me either at Donnie or at Standing for Truth. And that way I won't miss the questions. So with that, Charles Jennings, we're going to hand it over to you. And whenever you're ready, a oh, gentleman you need to share screen as well. You just let me know and I'll make sure that uh, your screen is shared and your slides are shared. And there it is, Charles, I can see it. All right. So the title of this debate is what is true biblical salvation? Uh, before I begin, I want to do a little bit of orientation for anybody that wants to debate me in the future. I have this debate, uh, Defending Free Grace debate prep, wherever all my all my debates prep for previous people to go here. That way you know exactly what I believe, what I'm anticipated, and there's 58 videos there for right now. I also have a debate after show playlist. I got to get it organized a little bit better, but that's another one I recommend you go through because you can see the evaluations of my debates and other people's debates to get a better articulation of where I'm coming from. Now, here's the SFT debate playlist. And the reason I mention this because I want people to see as they're looking at my debate preparation, whether they're wanting to debate me or whether they want to learn uh, the, the, the Rocky uh, homage uh, montage of, of training process and all of that is, uh, and those things like that, that they can go in, they can understand how I've progressed or, if, or evaluate whether I have progressed. The first guy debated. He believed you could lose your salvation, Daniel Mira. But the thing is, is that he did not prepare for his debate. That's not a problem with Travis Thomas. Travis Thomas has prepared for his debate, and he's even taken advantage of the content that I've shared in my debate prep and all that stuff. David Preston definitely prepared for my debates. His issue there being hyper grace and hyper dispensationalism. So the thing to navigate there was it's almost like you're debating a free grace person that's schizophrenic, that has Church of Christ beliefs in other areas. Crimson believes that you could lose your salvation, and he was the third person I debated. But that was a more concentrated exegetical debate, and those are my favorite types of debate. But typically, whenever I have to interact with a new category or person, it's more of a survey of the land, a fact-finding mission to get a feel for things and see if there's a specific debate, uh, part two, that we hone in on. Now, for my debate with Dave, uh, Dave, my second debate with David Preston, I went into more detail concerning James chapter two as it related to his belief. Then I debated Richard Lee. Richard Lee was the first official free Christ, according to him, that had a master's of divinity. And, and that's why it was good to debate him, because I want to deal with things at an academic level. I want to step things up, you know, and all of that. And then I debated C.J. Cox, which was a long time coming. That was reformed. And then I debated Turretin Fan, who's also reformed, but he's very academic and and uh, very beneficial. He does transparent debate preparation as well. So what I'm trying to say is I don't want to make take a step back. I don't want to go back to Daniel Mira battle mode, okay? So I'm going to take an academic approach to this, and we're going to see where it goes from there. So there's that debate. Now, uh, what I'm showing you, Travis already knows about, but in my preparation for him, what I did was I examined his debate from three years ago with Hyper Grace, Andrew Schluter, two years ago with Derek, a Presbyterian, uh, eight months ago with Trey Fisher, and then most recently, a month ago with Adam Carmichael, okay? And then I looked at the commonalities between them, and from that, I developed this chart. I didn't fill everything in, but basically what I want y'all to be thinking about is that Travis, I think right now, thinks that he has a process of salvation, okay, where I believe that all most of everything Travis is going to bring up is going to actually relate to a process of experiential sanctification. Now, the thesis of the debate is about true biblical salvation. 
So this is my assertion. True biblical salvation begins with an event that sets a process into motion that God brings to completion with another event of a death, a rapture, or a resurrection. To be more clear, true biblical salvation is, etern is eternally preserved based on the event of the person believing the gospel, which we could call positional faith. Positional faith is also a positional obedience. Since one obeys the command to believe the gospel at that one point in time, positional faith is also a positional work since it's an activity a person is responsible to do. Positional faith is biblically compared to one look at the bronze serpent in John 3 14 and 16. So when you map this out on my chart, for those that don't know, here's the event, here's the process, and here's the final event. So some people would think in terms of spirit, soul, or body. So there, here's the list of all those synonyms for descriptions, positional faith, positional obedience, and positional work. So when you're looking at this, and I don't know if this is sanctioned by the Church of Christ or what, but I see that it's commonly used. You'll see that the early part, the God's part, deals with kind of like the content of salvation that one has to believe. But then you have the hearing of the gospel, right, which a person can hear it but not believe it. But even in this system, there's a moment of belief, one moment of belief whenever a person uh, believes this message. And then I'm going to argue that the statements about repentance, confession, baptism, and remaining faithful are not uh, saying that the Church of Christ are teaching that you're saved by works positionally, but rather that this refers to experiential sanctification. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get Church of Christ to come back and reevaluate, maybe they have not been so careful in articulating this. And maybe that's when we need to clarify things because, you know, as we're interacting with Reformed people, they are thinking we're just work salvationists or antinomians and things like that. And we need to clarify these things. So, taking this and running through the chart, we got the concept of belief, repent, confess, and baptism. So, I've already talked about positional belief. We could talk about positional repentance, positional confession, positional baptism, which I believe is where the Holy Spirit places you into the body of Christ. And then there's then you have experiential belief, experiential repentance, experiential confession, and experiential water baptism and experiential faithfulness. Now, my contention is, is that what's done positionally cannot be reversed by anything done experientially or failed to do experientially. The way I say it is what's been done in time cannot reverse what's been done in eternity. So true biblical salvation is eternal preservation based on positional truth that cannot be reversed. No experiential truth can be conflated with positional truth. The experiential column cannot undo or disprove the positional truth column. To simplify the debate, I will usually take the experiential column for most passages as a default. This is to explore the limits of its explanatory power with each debate. So once again, there's the slide. Now, when I debated Richard Lee, this is how I described it. You have the positional activity here, and then you have the prepositional or preparatory activity for the unbeliever. There's a process where evangelism is going on. There's a process where a person is hearing, but they haven't got to the point of believing yet, which is one event. And then once they believe, then they make decisions in the process to repent, confess, get water baptized, be faithful, endure, and things like that. So this is how it relates to my over our chart that I can go into more detail. I don't use justification, sanctification, and glorification. I, I clarify everything uh, with the adjectives. I think it's like an adjective modification, positional, experiential, and ultimate, so that I can consider the possibilities and not fall into cliches. So when we're talking about repentance as it relates to Church of Christ and free grace, I want you all to know that there's four free grace views of positional repentance in general. So you have the prepositional or preparatory view that could be turning from sins, but not for salvation, but just because it's a, it's a good way. Uh, God wants you to live godly. God wants you to have blessings, that aspect of things. So it relates to the temporal aspect of things, or some people would even say a harmony with God in a sense. Then you have other views of the positional view. And so the positional views, they can include regret or omission of guilt. They can include internal resolve or turn from one's sins. 
they can include the change of mind or change of heart view. And we could go in more detail about this. And I'm actually working on this because I'm blessed in my seminary is that the free grace proponents that have wrote against Grudem after Grudem uh, wrote against them have been interacting with our seminary, uh, Dr. Dean's pastor's class. And so D Wilkin was in there uh, yesterday and I interacted with him about some of these things as well. So anyway, going forward. So what I'm saying is I reject the stairs of salvation that is typically associated with uh, the Church of Christ. And you know what? The Church of Christ may come to reject that as well, maybe through this articulation. But I accept stairs of experiential sanctification. I use this in the Richard Lee debate. This is a, a model by one of my pastor friends. Uh, he did this, but it still demonstrates that there are places in the text that talk about processes or steps. But this passage is all about experiential sanctification. So when I'm interacting with a passage of scripture, I always am asking this question in my mind. And so this is so Travis can know how I'm thinking. Does every process begin with an event? OK, if so, yes. Is there a passage that involves a process? Yes. So if a passage involves a process that automatically implicitly applies an event that set that process into motion. OK, and you could think of it like this. God is a creator and he created in an event. But if creation stopped existing, God still exists. So the event that began the process is independent of the process. It's the one, it was the first move, the one that set things into motion, but they're not conflated. And then the other thing is who ends the process in one event? Well, God does ultimately in physical death, rapture, or resurrection, depending on your eschatology. So uh, when I was early on, uh, preparing for this, I was examining this debate right here, and I kind of just started making early on rebuttals, and I'll still use this because I have a lot of content, and I'll just walk through this, but I'm just going to read slow, and you'll tell me when my time's up. I'm getting a drink of water right now. Travis thinks free You've grace. You've got exactly four minutes, Charles. Okay, great. Travis thinks free grace is a lie because he takes it as the same as Satan's lie that we will not die. But the annihilationist argues from the same passage. You know, they will say that that if we say we're going to live forever or that people are not going to burn in hell forever, they would say that 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 uh, that we're listening to the lie of Satan, you know, about do not die. And I may have got it that twisted up, but I think you all know what I'm saying. Um, so what is the intent of that passage? Is death physical or spiritual in the passage? If it's spiritual, it's a loss of fellowship regard requiring the need for positional salvation. And so the idea is there's no firemen needed if the house is not on fire. So Adam and Eve did not need salvation until they sinned. They had fellowship, they lost fellowship, but they never lost salvation. So Adam and Eve did not yet need positional salvation. It was not offered to them before the fall. Moron will not die. Does Travis think that once he gets to heaven that he can fall from heaven like Lucifer did? If so, then he has no assurance even in heaven. That would be hell to think about. If he thinks he is secure once he reaches heaven, then he too believes a promise that he will not die in the sense of going to hell. He said, or not going to hell. He said he believes in eternal security for the believer. Well, what if you stop believing in heaven? Travis thinks I will wiggle out from my position if he pins me. He is welcome to try. What is the intent of the passage referring to? So Travis in, in some of his other debates, you know, he talks about how people are good Christians. They're not trying to promote anything wrong, you know, and all of that, uh, you know, but other people will bring charges against free grace about antinomianism. And he's welcome to try that with me, because when you're talking about antinomianism, I don't believe the charge sticks with free grace because the issue is an intent, because it's the difference between manslaughter and murder. You could say that I'm showing negligence and I'm guilty of that, but you can't say I'm intending to destroy. You could accuse us of spiritual manslaughter or reckless endangerment, but not murder. The accusation could go both ways, but I prefer to deal with scripture, not accuse as much as possible. Travis says he believes in eternal security of the believer, meaning if you stop believing, then you are no longer eternally secure. But he also believes that not going to church is a sin that can cause you to lose your salvation. In fact, he thinks he lost his salvation because he did not attend church while in the military. 
he has believed uh, for Church of Christ since like age 15. But I wonder if he believed the gospel that I did without water baptism when he first attended Baptist churches. If so, then I would say that Travis, if he believed the gospel at one moment in time, he's eternally secure and I'll see him in heaven. Travis believes that apostasy or even not trying will cause you to lose your salvation. But what is not trying? What's the minimum one does not have to one try? One minute. He said he lost it by not attending church. How many church services do you have to miss to lose your salvation? Travis argues that since the Christian is not supposed to let sin reign in him, that if we teach something that allows people to sin, then we're promoting false security. But does his position allow people to sin if they confess? What if it's private sin? What if it's public sin? How much sin or what kind of sin before Church of Christ disown you? Isn't that what you mean by your loss of salvation? You were not in the good graces with the Church of Christ? Sounds kind of Catholic or cultish to me. I'll stop right there. Thank you very much there, Charles, for that 15-minute opening statement. I understand these openings really do fly by. Before I hand it over to Travis, I will let the audience know that I am all caught up on your questions, and we've only gone through one opening statement so far, and we've already got some solid questions coming in. Matthew Sneed sends in a $20 super chat, says, keep up the good work, SFT. I appreciate the support. God bless. Okay, so with that, Travis Thomas, we are now going to hand it over to you. And whenever you're ready, you've got 15 minutes. The floor is yours. Okay, I got a slide. Can you put that up? Definitely, yep. As long as you make sure to click the uh, present so at the bottom, if you're familiar with uh, StreamYard, Travis. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Once you click the present, you'll see the bottom icon says share screen. Usually I pick entire screen and then you'll yeah, there we go. I'll see it. You're good to go. All right. Thanks again for having me. Thanks for Charles for uh willing to debate this, discuss this. He has actually put a lot of time into his debate as well as he went through. But I just, I, just a little bit before I started this, I kind of changed actually my whole presentation. And I want to read this part here that when I was going uh, to college, it was a communication class. And this is something that I always remember from school. It says deletions occur too because of your beliefs. If you believe something to be true, you have almost infinite capacity to delete information that contradicts that belief. And that applies to me too, right? It applies to all of us. In addition, if you believe something to be true, you will go out your whole go through your whole life searching for information that supports that belief and ignores the rest of the information. And this is um, the facts of it. This is true. I mean, as I just as we just started, these are comments from the viewers. They have they're not many of them are you know, they're not even open to listen. They said salvation requires faith. It's that simple. They hadn't even heard my position from the scriptures. And that's why I feel like you're just not going to convince people in one debate. You got to get on my YouTube channel and it doesn't make money. All right. And this other person, he says, baptism regeneration is nonsense. I don't believe that. That's what the Catholics believe. If you continue to listen to people, uh, that are not members of the Church of Christ on YouTube, you're just going to be so confused. You don't even, you won't even know what actually the Lord's Church teaches. And people like this, thinking that we believe in the original sin and we teach baptism regeneration just like the Catholics. Now look, Matthew put, he says, wrong, you overlooked the most famous verse. See, we're going to look at that. That's what a lot of people do. They have their one verse, they memorize their one verse, and that's it. And Charles, sadly to say, I wrote down, he did beat Matthew. He beat him by maybe 14, 15, by two verses. He used John 3, 14 through 16. So he beat you, Matthew. You knew one verse. Charles knew three. And that's what you get. And then this guy here, he says, both are false. And we haven't even presented our views. This is the mentality on YouTube and Facebook. And people have their mind made up. And a lot of them you can't convince. Now, this guy, he's just like the young rich ruler. That's what, see, I just don't know if you guys actually spend a lot of time reading your Bible. You just read one verse, then you go about 
doing whatever you want to do. You don't put any time in. You're not like the noble Bereans in Acts 17, 11, where it says they searched the scriptures. Oh, you would put, they searched the scripture. John 3, 16, hey, that's it. And we're going to look at some videos of Charles and his friends. Um, you know, that's pretty much what they hold to. And Clint here, a brother in Christ, he says, Lordship salvation has more than one concept. Actually, I actually told the guys, I'm really not familiar with this, a, a lot of this terminology. See, I'm a Christian. Biblical salvation kind of sums it up. Biblical salvation. You go to the Bible, you see what they did to be saved, you do that, and you're saved. And a lot of people don't even understand the authority of the scriptures. God authorizes through four ways. Examples, implication, direct statement, and expediency. Now, I went through, and I've got examples here. I've got, you know, some people don't even know if they're under the Old Testament or the New Testament today. Some people, um, they just don't quite understand that. They don't put their time in. They don't understand, like, there's temporary things in the Bible. As we see the apostles in the, uh, in the New Testament times, those were temporary. They're not permanent, all right? Like in 1 Corinthians 14, you see spiritual gifts. See, those are... There were temporary. You don't have those today. So when you guys run to Ephesians 1, is it 12 through 14, where you're sealed with the Holy Spirit, you don't understand hermeneutics properly, hermeneutics. You don't understand everything that you read about the Holy Spirit may be temporary. It may be a miraculous measure. You guys ain't healing people. All y'all got health insurance. You're dying with cancer. You can't speak in tongues. And you guys claim that you have the Holy Spirit. You can't do one miracle. And you see in Mark chapter 16, 18 through 20, if you look at the later part, it was for confirming the word. See, the Bible is the final authority. He mentioned some of these men. He better get into some of the men of the Bible, like the Apostle Paul, Jesus, and such. You know, and then there's circumstances, conditions, you know, like the Sabbath day. Just because you read of the Sabbath day doesn't mean the Sabbath day is going on today. They were Jews. That's why Lydia was there on the Sabbath day worshiping God, and the condition is she was baptized. There's incidental and there's essential. Incidental, we, we see midnight, many lights, upper chamber, third lot, but there's essential on the first day of the week. You, that's where the Sabbatarians run into. The whole religious world is mass confused, and I could teach you guys if you guys would give me an opportunity. You have custom and divine law. You have 1 Corinthians 11 where it talks about head coverings, and people mix that up. And so I do hope that Donnie didn't leave because I want to go and switch. Oh, yeah, I'm sharing my screen, so I can just pull up the, the real presentation I have. But I just want to plant that seed that a lot of confusion there is with individuals. Now, we're going to take a look at this. Listen to this. Now, hopefully you guys can hear it. Let me turn my volume up. I turned it down earlier. Now, let me go again. Let's see. It's interesting, this whole, like, faith alone is the question. Like, oh, it never says alone. But if it's literally saying, you look at John 3, 16, it's, it's pretty simple. Um, Jesus is requiring belief in him alone. It literally just in him. Belief in him, you receive eternal life. Just one verse. He's not attaching anything else. So we can literally say that it is talking about belief alone. This. Because they cherry pick. See, we have some people in the chat, they just want to cherry pick Romans 5 1. You got to take the sum of God's word. Now, it? that was pre recorded. They were reviewing my debate. You know, I understand he wasn't using Romans 5 1, but this is why I wanted to play that. Belief in him alone. Literally, just in him. Belief in him, you receive eternal life. He's not attaching anything else. So we can literally say that it is talking about belief alone. This. Because they cherry pick. See, we have some people in the chat, they just want to cherry pick Romans 5 1. You got to take the sum of God's word, the entirety. And then he introduces how. See, you're. He don't take the sum of God's word, he only takes some of God's word. <laughs> this is correct. Yeah. It's not like we're saying that it has to say the word alone in the context. The context is only giving one condition to be saved. So one. can clearly say that it is one verse. condition alone to be saved. He don't take the sum of God's word, he only takes some of God's word. He's talking about me. Charles right, is talking about me. That's really all this. Right. And in my yeah. opinion, man, I've been in a lot of these kind of discussions, uh, either Arminian, Arminianism, Calvinism, it all really can boil down to John 3.16. Yeah. 
That's it, guys. He don't take the summer God's word. He only takes summer. I think you guys kind of get the point of that slide. For we don't have all night, and I want to try to use more of my PowerPoint. But Charles in his chart. I, well, I reviewed his chart. Charles gets to see. He gets. It's like let's just say we're all all thousand of us, or how many views this get. We're playing Monopoly, and we got the Monopoly book right here, the New Testament system. Charles comes along with his own rules. See, I mean, that's kind of what this chart is. And we're going to examine this chart. Now, see, he gets to make his chart, and you get, and I've got to match his chart because his chart is divine. No, his chart has flaws. And see, I get to make my chart, I guess. So the Bible chart. See, I'm not worried about the free grace chart. I'm worried about the biblical chart, the Bible chart. So we have a position, right? It, you see, it's an event. And you have the process is a conversion account. And you have the conversion account, and then you have the conversion account. All of this would be, I guess we can use his terminology, positional uh, positional faith or, or salvation or however he puts it. And then you have the ultimate, you have the judgment day. So we look here, true biblical salvation begins with an event. That's what he says. Well, the event is the conversion account. Do you know what that means? That means when you open your Bible and you go to the book of Acts, you find a lost person and you read. See, God gave us a brain, but as you know, some people already made up their mind, as I proved. You know, even Charles can agree with that. Well, that one guy says, We're both wrong, Charles. He hadn't even heard our position. This is the mentality of YouTube world. And this is why this year I'm probably not going to do many debates because to me it's about pointless in the YouTube world and social media. Now, Paul did go into the synagogues and he reasoned with them daily. But I think there's something different about being one-on-one -on -one in the social media world. But you can find some good and honest people. Even watching Charles's debate, there was one guy got on there, and Charles was reviewing uh, my Once Saved, Always Saved debate. And basically, Charles and the other individuals kind of made this guy leave. He kept asking questions. And it was obvious that you, you can lose your salvation through that debate. And so there is some people out there that maybe are just seeking what the Bible says. So you see the conversion event. That sets forth a process. The process is being faithful, not perfect. As he stated, I wrote it down, how much sin? Just like the young rich ruler. You know, he asked, well, what do I need to do? I have to be perfect. Well, I mean, we're going to look at what Andrew Sluter said. He can drive to Tennessee, shoot me and rob me, kill me and go straight to heaven. Well, that sounds real encouraging. That's real biblical. But being faithful. Now notice this, true biblical salvation is eternally preserved based on the event of the person believing. Now he would say faith alone, I guess a mental ascent of the death, burial, and resurrection. Now he says positional, um, positional obedience and positional work are all the same, right? But listen to what he says. He gets on to me. He's not consistent. He is basically sort of a little bit of a hip, hypocrite. Listen. That's how synecdic he is. Yeah, this is your, uh, yeah, the synecdoche is where it's like it means two different things. Go ahead and explain it for those who don't completely. Understand. Now, I'm debating a Calvinist. And I asked him what a synecdoche was. He basically says, oh, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, you go ahead and tell them. My wife said, why didn't you turn that around and said, you tell everybody so we make sure that you're explaining it right. That guy didn't know that. And through the whole debate, he says, well, I know everything you're going to say. And he didn't even know what a synecdoche was. Understand? And you're going to go to figure of speech. So like when you say nice wheels, you're referring to not just the wheels on the car, but to the car itself. So it's, it's a part of a speech that basically sums up the whole. And this is what he's saying. All the positional faith and obedience and, and personal uh, positional work, that's all the same. See, Charles is fine with using that as a synecdoche, but when I go and use faith, showing that faith, biblical saving faith, is a synecdoche, summing up repentance, confessing, and being baptized, no, no, no. See, I don't get to he don't, I don't get to do that, but he can do that. See, that's what many people do when they're teaching false doctrine. Now, I'm not trying to be mean at all, but hey, someone's got to be wrong, but the Bible is right. And the only way you're going to know is if you open your mind and stop the, all this, whether you're both wrong and you're teaching baptism, your regeneration. And, and as he stated, you must be in the good graces in, of the COC, the Church of Christ. No, you must be in the good graces of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
But see, he says the Church of Christ making it sound like some kind of cult system out there like the Jehovah Witnesses. No, you must be right with God and the good graces of God. So we see here, true biblical salvation is eternally preserved based on the event. Well, it's real small print. I got here the event. The event, if you would open your Bibles, the event is the uh, Ethiopian unit. We see a conversion. See, Philip, he had to have a preacher. Philip went and preached. He preached Jesus to him. I should have made it larger, but I had to fill it all in on this. And you know what? When he preached Jesus, see, I preached Jesus, the eunuch brings up water. Why do you think the eunuch brought up water? Now, some of y'all need to stop typing all this stuff in the chat and actually listen. If you want to go to heaven, you've got to listen. It takes a little bit of work. So he preached Jesus, and then the guy says, well, here's water. Why did the guy bring up water? Because he preached the gospel, and Jesus said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Philip preached what Jesus said. How did he do that? Why did he do that? Because it was the message of the Spirit given to those guys. He says, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and he was baptized. What was he baptized for? Now, see, in the religious world, you're baptized, I guess, because you probably didn't take a bath that day and you had to get physically clean. That's what some people say. Or they sprinkle you. They sprinkle a little baby that, that can't even have faith. And Or maybe they baptize you for an outward sign of an inward change. Or maybe they baptize you as he says. See, Charles, we're going to talk a little bit later. Charles is already starting to agree with me. He said you have to be baptized. That's what he said. Baptized by the Spirit. Oh, we're going to look at that here in a little bit. But notice what Ananias said. A gospel preacher told Philip to be baptized to wash away his sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Pretty simple, isn't it? Pretty simple. Now, this experiential position, I, I really want him to go into explaining more because the way I looked it up and tried to study it is basically he's going off an experience that happened. The, sometimes I deal with people who say like they got in a car wreck, they flipped over five times, they got off drugs. That's their proof of their salvation. That is not biblical, friends. We're talking about the title is tonight, Biblical Salvation. Go to the Bible. No one got off of heroin and proved they were saved. They repented, they confessed, and they were baptized for the remission of their sins. Those things that happen in our lives is not any kind of account to show that we are Christians. You have to go to the Bible and do what the Bible did. Look, listen here. Charles denies his position. 20 seconds. Oh, 20 seconds already. We're going to get through it. That's my point. You can't fault my view for saying you have no passage, you have no proof that somebody was saved by faith alone when the purpose of the Bible is not to explain how to be saved by faith alone. All right, that's probably 20 seconds, but you heard what he said. Thank you, guys. Okay, gentlemen, thank you very much for the engaging 15-minute opening statement. Lots of excellent points on the table. This should definitely be a fun back and forth. But before we get into any uh, back and forth, we do have our 10-minute rebuttals. And so, Charles, we are going to now hand it back to you. Let me restart the timer. And, Charles, whenever you're ready, just make sure to unmute. You've got 10 minutes. Go ahead. Okay, yeah. So... The term syndectiki, and uh, I don't even say it right, but I think that you're confusing syndectiki with synonymous or synonym. Whenever you're evaluating any word, if you make a Venn diagram, you know, the different circles, this word, let's say agape, phileo, and then eros, or some other word like that, you're thinking about the semantic overlap that is determined by that. Now, each lexical word has its own semantic domain or range. And then in certain contexts, you have certain overlaps. And so that's what you're evaluating. So I would say they're not syndectiques. What it is, is that based on what I found in scripture, I found where those nuances of those particular words show up. And you're welcome to challenge me in those particular passages concerning that. And uh, um, just a couple other things, you know, I, number one, I really liked your presentation. Uh, you were true to form. Uh, uh, you, ex uh, yeah, everything that you did, I expected. I really appreciate that you're challenging the chart, but I don't think that your challenge will hold as we interact with the specific passages that you bring up. As for the assumption that I go by a one verse approach, test me on that. And let's see what happens. As for the claim about the rich young ruler, 
I don't take that referring to salvation. So that's not an issue. As for me being inconsistent, we can all be inconsistent. Now, the, the whole thing that I base my understanding of salvation of Church of Christ on, because I'm debating you, is because you said you lost your salvation when you were in the military because you were not going to church at that time. You were not in the good graces of the Church of Christ. Now, I understand that you believe that the Church of Christ is sanctioned by God, that it's the Lord's church. But the Catholics make the same claim, and they have their own variation of state of grace, as well as their own variation of sacraments. Now, what I hope is that the Church of Christ do not have a system of sacraments, okay? I hope that's not what's going on here. I want to say that you do believe in positional faith. If you want to call it faith alone, which I don't use, but it, uh, typically, but if you want to, if you want to say that, then I would argue that water baptism is experiential. The reason being is because you believe before you get baptized. That means the event of believing is distinct from water baptism. The moment you talk about water baptism, you're talking about an act of obedience that's experiential because you've already met the requirement to be uh, 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 believe in the gospel to be positionally saved. So I, and far as about spirit baptism, yeah, let's examine it. And far as experiential, that's just referring to the idea that after your initial salvation, you, you have a temporal life to live on earth. You have an interaction with the Holy Spirit. You have an interaction with the word of God. And, and you have a responsibility for God. And so that's what I mean by experience. I'm not talking, and it's experiential. I'm not talking about charismatic experiences or things like that. Now, it is true. Experiences exist in the process before the event of salvation, uh, but, uh, positional salvation. And there's an experience after that. But that doesn't undermine the chart. I even mentioned preparatory processes uh, before in that presentation. Some of the terms and categories you used in your opening, I really liked, and I recognize a lot of those things. And uh, so just like I have new language, you've given me new language. And maybe in future interactions, we can get into this. And far as me being a legalist, I might be a legalist, but I got to find out, you know, a ledger is something that balances things, it justifies things, it rationalizes things. And if it's true, that the Bible talks about three tenses of salvation. And I'm not talking about grammatical tense. I'm talking about contextual tense, about Jesus Christ coming back, Jesus Christ dying in the past, and those things like that. Then I think it's a viable option to evaluate every word of the Bible through that system, because that's how God relates to us is through time. Now, I'm just going to continue uh, running through my uh, 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 slides and just pick up what I can, you know, going from there. All right. Travis believes that Christians need to examine himself to see if he's saved. But if 13.5 is talking about proof that God is speaking through the people challenging Paul, not positional salvation. So that's an option. Also, do you trust your own evaluation of self or does it really come down to how the Church of Christ evaluates you? I only believe I'm saved because of the promise of Scripture, which is easier to evaluate your life or evaluate whether you believe the promise of God at one moment in time. Travis uses Romans 6 to argue that if we don't yield, then we're not saved. But where in Romans does Paul make that argument? What constitutes not yielding enough? How many tickets do you get torn up before one sticks? Travis uses 1 Timothy 1, 18 through 20 to argue that to be shipwrecked means to lose salvation. But the metaphor may be built on Paul's life, and Paul survived shipwreck. Also, how do they learn not to blasphemy? It didn't say so. You will learn. Also, the phrase is similar in 1 Corinthians 5, which is another passage you probably take as a proof text for loss of salvation. But if you want to abandon the context and jump there, at least weigh in on this passage. Uh, Travis uses 2 Timothy 4.10 to argue that salvation can be lost. Yes, Demas forsakes Paul, but did he forsake the Lord? And even if he forsakes the Lord, why do you think you can lose your salvation? What has been done in our temporal life cannot reverse what has been done in eternity. While one enters into a new realm from time, time cannot reverse that. Once a citizen of God's space station, always, even if you sojourn on earth. Travis uses someone saying, what's the point if eternal security is true, if it leads to empty churches? Well, I'm not surprised at this carnal thinking. A carnal believer will only think in the short term. But is this an argument to pragmatism? It's not true because it's not working. So is making people think they have to stay in the good graces of the Church of Christ, keeping people scared enough to stay safe? 
Is that why you think you're saved now? Travis thinks Judas lost his salvation. Well, if the passage about Satan entering into Judas could be interpreted to refer to a believer, right? But I don't believe in demon possession of believers. But if he wants to grant that, then uh, then Andrew Schluter and him went down that road. Does this mean Travis believes Christians could be possessed? How does he know he's not possessed right now? How does he know the Church of Christ organization is not possessed? But let's assume this passage can be taken differently. Then free grace still has an answer. It's an extreme minority view that I can't think of one well-known proponent of it. Three minutes. But if Judas was saved, then he is still eternally secure. So if you could think in your mind that you could be saved but be demon-possessed, then you could still make an argument that Judas was eternally secure. I don't think I can do it, but I will tell you this. Nothing Judas done in time could reverse that if it was true. The passages about being lost would then refer to those who were in service as the 12 and not their salvation. If I tell you, you boarded a vessel that you will reach your destination, this is a promise that's guaranteed. If you affirm my ability and act like a good passenger, that I'm a good captain, and you join my fleet, this is a promise of future reward and future service. If you deny my ability to do this or act like a bad passenger or crew, I will also deny your opportunity to be rewarded for trusting me. Promise a loss of reward or future service. But I'm faithful to my promises, regardless of so I'm talking about getting you to the destination or also holding you accountable for your behavior on the ship. And so this is how it relates to the chart. How much time I got left, SFT? Hello, SFT? Yeah, you've got exactly, let me see here, two minutes. Okay. So this is relating to the chart. Same illustration. Positionally, if I tell you you boarded the vessel, that condition is met. You boarded the vessel. So this means that the promise is you will reach your destination. And then the, all the stuff in the middle experiential column relates to either rewards or demerits. And then the, the true thing that's throughout the whole thing is that God is faithful to his promises positionally and also to hold you accountably to get you there ultimately. Now, this is how it relates to 2 Timothy chapter 2, which comes up in all of my debates. And uh, I've actually been in recent discussion with this in scholarship. So this is good that this is all happening, part of God's providence. Position, if we died with him, and we did because he's our substitution and sacrifice, then we will also live with him. This is a guarantee that we're getting a glorified body. So everything in an experience that relates to service to him, uh, reigning with him or denying him or being faithless, will not reverse those conditions. Uh, that condition because we've already met the condition of dying with him. Also, he remains faithful because of that promise of what he did at the cross. He remains faithful and cannot deny himself as he holds us accountable as to rewards. And he remains faithful in the sense that he's going to deliver us and give us a glorified body as Philippians 3.21 talks about we can be conformed to the image of his body. 30 seconds. Now, I can barely talk about this, uh, but I'm just going to say this is that you will hear a lot of people say that, that free grace does not believe that necessary results occur. Positionally, they occur, and experientially, they occur. You're automatically placed into union with Christ, and all the blessings that you receive necessarily occur at that moment. And you're automatically placed into fellowship with God until the next moment you sin. So there are necessary results. Your fruit are bare during that time. But you're, it's not necessary for you to get back into fellowship, meaning no one forces you to do it. You have to make a moment-by-moment moment choice. And that's what I'm talking about in experiential sanctification. God bless. Thank you very much for that 10-minute rebuttal. Charles, fast-paced debate so far. I'm really enjoying it. Travis, we're going to hand it over to you now. And I am going to reset the timer. You've also got 10 minutes for a rebuttal whenever you're ready. Just make sure to unmute yourself. And if you need me to share your screen, just let me know. I think you might be muted, Travis. There we go. I couldn't find it. I don't use this program much. Yeah, if you want to go ahead and share my screen. Sure. All right, listen to this, guys. Salvation of the soul. All the prayers of man they pray. All the Bible Travis, I'm going to stop your timer and just recommend one thing because it's slightly hard to hear, but I think I have a way where we can hear it better. Here, I'll turn up my volume. Okay, let, let's see. Take some of God's word <laughs> to all the services he may attend, 
all the sermons exactly. he may practice, yeah. all the debts he may pay, all the ordinances he may observe, all the laws he may keep, all the benevolent acts he may perform, will not make his soul one whit safer. And all the sins he may commit from idolatry to murder will not make his soul in any more danger. The man, the way a man lives has nothing whatsoever to do with his salvation of his soul. As that position there, would you say, no, that's not technically right, or would you say that actually is right? I describe to that 100%. 100%. Okay. Don't matter what you do. So you're saying that I could tell you where I live at, you could drive to Tennessee and shoot me and rob me, and you would still be heaven bound. Absolutely. Drive still be heaven bound. Absolutely. Absolutely. Tennessee. That's what, that is what you're getting with the same system, basically. You can just do whatever. You know, I mean, you just go and kill people, rob people, kidnap their kids, and you're heaven bound. And that is American society today. We want to take one pill. You believed. You want to take one pill and lose 100 pounds. You don't want to put no, you don't want to do nothing. You know, you just want, that's what people are a lot of times today. They just want everything free, everything given to them. And they don't want to even do anything. And this guy here says he can come to Tennessee and shoot me and rob me. Now, I want you guys to get on YouTube. Some of y'all like YouTube. You got to watch this debate here. See? I'm just a member of the Church of Christ. I'm not Church of Christ. This is a gospel preacher. 44,000 views. You've got to see this guy debates a, a Baptist. Uh, another guy born in sin. you got to get on YouTube, watch this, 34,000 views. And you have got to see this debate. This is a Calvinist, and this guy, Aaron Gallagher, destroys this Calvinist guy. You've got to get, you guys like to watch debates, get on GBN on YouTube. Or here's this one. I had a live debate. I had a Calvinist come to my house. And one thing, I guess, that the Calvinists, what Charles was saying backstage, that basically the Calvinists say, okay, uh, no works are involved, but if you don't have works, you're probably never saved to begin with. How much common, how much sense does that make? I mean, I'm like, that's, that does, that's not even any logical sense. And you can watch a Calvinist came to my house and we debated in person. Now, here I have a playlist. Look up the debates if you want to see debates. Uh, from gospel preachers. Now, I just got some of this here. Now, there is some people that are somewhat honest. Richard here, he put in the comments, rise up, Paul, and be baptized and wash away your sins. Do you know why he said that? I hope Richard didn't say that because that's the way he was raised. That's what Acts 22 verse 16 said in my presentation. See how that works? Now, this guy here, he says, Travis, trust Jesus. Now, I'm going to turn it back on you, church phone. Mark 16, 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Why don't you trust Jesus? Oh, you're a hypocrite. You're telling me to trust Jesus, and you don't even trust Jesus. Jesus said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. You see how this works in the chat? And I'm probably not going to convince Charles, but biblical salvation, I probably have five minutes. All right, Someone that is countable, that's who needs to be saved. Little kids are not lost. All right, People with handicaps uh, that are handicapped, they're not lost. All right, We, we got free will. A person sins, okay? First John 3, 4. They break God's law. Sin separates them from God. And a person realizes they need to be saved. God sent his only begotten son, Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one. And he is deity. He's the great I am. He died. He rose again. He went back to heaven. He sent, he sent the Holy Spirit to the men. The apostles and certain other writers were inspired and some of the other first century Christians. Now, you guys don't have the Holy Spirit like they did in the Bible. You just don't have it according to Acts chapter 8, all right? You, you haven't met an apostle that laid hands on you, and you hadn't been baptized with the Holy Spirit. Men taught the gospel. They taught the gospel. Believe. that Believe about Jesus and, and believe about the kingdom. Now, the kingdom is the church of Christ. He says repent. These men in the Bible, repent. Turn to God. Confess Jesus. Be baptized in water for the sins. And people either obey that or they turn their back on the gospel. They refuse to accept the gospel terms. And when they do that, they actually turn their back on God. That's biblical salvation summed up pretty much right there. All right. When you see conversion accounts, you go to the Bible. You go to the book of Acts. Notice this. Now, this chart here has, he likes to use charts, but you notice mine is biblical. He's coming up with some kind of theory that he's established through, um, I, I'll be nice to Charles. I, I, I was going to say, Cemetery schools, but seminary schools. He he went there. He learned some kind of chart system. Five minutes. And when we look in the Book of Acts, you have the Jews. Now the Jews believed. They repented. Now they 
it never said they confessed. You see that little star in there? But remember when I said by implication we learn, apparently they confessed. See, when you go through the conversion accounts, if one, one particular person or group, uh, maybe they mentioned that they, uh, like Lydia, you see the chart there, Lydia. Uh, you guys can see this one here. Let me move. Like Lydia, she, it, the Bible says that she didn't believe. We know she believed. It didn't say she repented, but we noticed she was baptized. And we noticed all these over here. What were they baptized? Well, Saul was baptized to wash away his sins. The Jews were baptized for the remission of sins. So why in the world would some of y'all in the chat put Lydia was baptized for an outward sign of an inward change when Saul was baptized for the remission of sins and the Jews? See, you guys have no kind of logical processing to connect the dots. And, and, and when I say people are ignorant, I'm not insulting you. I'm ignorant about a lot of stuff. I'm ignorant about a lot of his big words he's using. But see, the gospel is for the common man. You don't have to have all of this big terminology, as someone put in the chat. So how sins are forgiven today? Well, it had a beginning spot. We're going to look at that. Now, Charles went to John. Now, the and Word of God says there was a beginning at Jerusalem, okay? Now, the Jews of everywhere for there, everywhere uh, from every nation, Acts 2, 1. Now, now, some of you guys thinking that the Jews... Yeah, they had to be baptized for the remission of sins, but the Gentiles don't. No, because we see in Galatians 1.23, referring to Paul, he was preaching the faith he once destroyed. So Paul, James, John, Peter, all those guys, they, they taught the same thing for some of you in the chat, that thinking that some kind of dispensation has happened in the middle of Acts somewhere, and they can't ever prove it. So the gospel of Christ was first preached, all right, uh, uh, in Acts 2, 36, it was, it was proven by God. Jesus was crucified. They preached the gospel. He raised from the dead to fulfill Old Testament prophets, prophecies. And in Acts 2, 37, notice this. It says, what shall we do? These guys ask. Now, in the time frame, it is so hard to answer some of the stuff he said. And the same thing I could say, well, he didn't answer a lot of stuff I said. Well, I mean, you're limited on time. That's why I don't think I'm going to convince you guys. You guys maybe are 30 to 40, 50, 60 years old. Some of y'all been in your denomination for 50 years. You think I'm going to convince you what your mama and daddy taught you guys for that long? No, you've got to actually say, you know what, Travis is making somewhat logical sense. Besides the guy says, Travis says, blah, 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 blah in the chat. And go to my YouTube channel and you can call me on my broadcast and I will show you what the Bible says. If I can't show you what the Bible says, I'll either study it or I'll change my position. See how it works? In the churches of Christ, it's kind of like we say, we take the Bible alone. And if you can show us, a, a real Christian, something that we're teaching that the Bible isn't teaching, we need to repent. We need to get right with the Bible. I got two minutes. So these guys ask, what do we do? Now, these guys wasn't asking about what do we know we need to get at Walmart or down at the dollar store. They're saying we had killed Jesus. And they say, what do we do? And then... The Holy Spirit, again, John 16, it says that when the Spirit will come, he will convict the world of sin. Well, he's came in Acts chapter 2, right? Now, again, this is another chat guy. Baptism is an outward sign. No, no scripture. Can't find it in the Bible. Baptism is for the remission of sins, what, what, what we just read. And uh, Charles says they were saved. They were saved before. Were they? Oh, no, he says they were saved in Acts 2.37. I, I, I'm sorry. Uh, but was they saved before Peter preached? Was they saved during his sermon? Was they saved when they said, what do we do? Uh, was they saved uh, when Peter gave them the answer from God? Or were they saved in Acts 2, 40, when it says, save yourselves or be saved? See, they wasn't saved in verse 37. See, he has a preconceived notion that you're saved by faith alone, so it has to be. See, it has to be. It can't be that they were actually baptized for forgiveness, meaning salvation, they repented because he has preconceived. See, in Acts chapter 2, I should have put that. Uh, it says, some of them gladly received the word and were baptized. See, a lot of people, they're not going to. And again, he says, save yourselves. These guys were not saved. If you keep reading, you know, Charles will say they're saved already. No. If they did, Peter sure didn't know by the inspired word of God. But Peter had the message from God. Uh, I would play that. I don't have enough time. We're going to get into maybe definitions. There's the definitions that I would hold, Charles, for repentance. That 20 seconds. Vines, Kittle's Theological Dictionary, A.T. Robertson defines it. He has his uh, position. Notice it's free grace views 
it's got to fit in the fifth free grace. So, and again, we we'll close out right here. Acts two thirty eight, very simple. Okay, Travis, thank you very much for that ten minute rebuttal, gentlemen. That concludes uh, the opening statements and the rebuttals for tonight's debate. I appreciate the energy. I appreciate the knowledge uh, coming from the both of you. We've got a lot of excellent points. Also, I appreciate the visuals. Helps uh, make the points more understandable for sure. So uh, to the audience, we are now jumping into our cross exam. And so feel free to continue tagging me with your questions. I am all caught up on audience questions for now. Okay, so Travis just ended with his 10-minute rebuttal. And therefore, Charles, we're going to give you the first 25 minutes to lead the way in cross-exam. Gentlemen, the floor is yours. Okay, I'm going to share my screen because I like to draw. It just helps me process things. And uh, so just understand I'm doing that. And uh, so my first question to you, uh, Travis, is which passage would you like for us to look at in detail that you believe refutes my chart? Well, uh, Charles, sort of with your chart, I don't quite understand fully um, how you're coming up with your chart. Okay. I mean, where did you come up with your chart? I mean, that's what kind of, I'm just curious. Well, you, when you read scripture, I mean, you, you state, read statements like you have been saved, you know, you will be saved. And that was the preliminary aspect of things. It, okay. I was not in seminary. There was a time that I did read Schofield's Rightly Dividing the Word of Truth, and it had that chart. But I was actually doing some uh, uh, other Bible studies before that time. And it's been in church history. Typically, people just use the term justification, sanctification, and glorification. But when I studied scripture, I saw that those three terms are used in three different senses. And so then I had to say, you know, I need to clarify this. And so therefore, I would say positional justification, experiential justification, ultimate glorification. You know, I would use that as to modify those things because I believe that those, those distinctions are in the text. But I think people have put words in the wrong place or not recognize that the, the word can have a different range of meaning depending on the context. Okay, so the way well, some of some some of it, you know, I am just a, I'm just a country boy from Tennessee, so right. and and I think the gospel it needs to be preached in a way that the common person now, unless everybody in the chat has went to seminary school, uh, I did catch some of the key words you said about justified, saved, forgiveness. We need to go to the Bible and basically determine uh, the context from that. So you brought up. Uh, John 3, right? Mm -hmm. John 3, 14 through 16. So is that your basis of your foundation of biblical salvation, that we would go to that and find biblical salvation? No, not necessarily. Um, because that passage actually depends on a passage from the Old Testament. And if you don't understand... What's so interesting about that particular passage is that the passage from the New Testament... Is not talking about how to be saved from hell. It's being how to be saved from God's discipline uh, by fiery serpents. But the but the scriptures are 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 given accounts of what's being said with the theological purpose to make a tie-in, and so it makes a comparison between as Moses is lifted up in the wilderness, which is a one-time thing, and it only took a one look for them to be healed from the bronze serpent. And then it relates it to the son uh, believing in the son. And so I, and, it's, and Charles is going to jump in here, here real yeah. quick. No worries. I'm going to um, mm -hmm. pause the timer since it is your 25 minutes to lead the way. Let's make sure that whatever statements we make, you know, currently like right now, okay. let's wrap it up with a question for uh, Travis. OK, yeah. So why do you think that John 316 is the only verse that I'm hanging my argument on? OK. Well, one reason I was brought it up is most of the through, through your pre presentation, that was probably the key verse that really stuck out, and that was the logical conclusion of of uh, belief. And they looked, so they only looked once, so therefore we only believe once. And so your whole theological uh, 
ideal is based off of belief here in this verse, and they look one time, so we only have to believe once, and that's it. That's kind of why I brought it up. Okay, no, that's fair. Um, the to clarify something before I ask my next question, that's based on the theological purpose for the book that these things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And so that means that there's an expectation that the Gospel of John includes evangelistic content. Some people call it the Gospel of Belief, where I believe most of the Bible is all about experiential sanctification. In other words, your walk, how you serve the Lord, how you fellowship, how you worship the Lord. Um, but so, but if you, and, and I don't expect you to know this, but I've even attempted to try to argue that John 3.16 could possibly even be experiential because you have a textual variant about continue to believe uh, that is it in the place of the purpose statement. And I've tried that theory, but I don't think it holds based on the comparison of the one moment. Because as you know, the believeth you've made an argument before in the English, people try to say that that means continuous action. But I can go in both English and the Greek if we need to, to show that that's not necessarily the case. In context, based on that comparison of that story in the Old Testament, clarifies what the, what the author means with his purpose. So okay. I'm not depending on one verse. I'm depending on the overall compositional analysis structure of the book of Gospel John that's indicating its purpose and intent. Okay. So my next question to you is this, is that uh, where do you think that uh, you have to be water baptized to be saved. What verse would you like to go to, to, to make that argument that a person has to be water baptized to be saved? Uh, well, I think one of the best verses to go to is in a reference, uh, a cross reference with Luke 24, was it 47, showing that there was a beginning, there was a beginning, meaning through time, this happened, this happened, this happened, and now there's a beginning, and we see that beginning in Acts chapter 2. So I would say, you know, Acts 2, 38, Acts 2, the context, is a very good, you know, place to start. Okay. All right. Well, if we're, if we're talking historical, then you would have, historically wise, you know, you have the, the Mosaic Law. Then you have Jesus, uh, John the Baptist coming on the scene, him calling his disciples. And so the events and sayings that are mentioned in the Gospels precede Luke 24, and then you come to Acts 2. And Acts 2, even though these events are early on, Acts was not written till later on in the church age. So there was other epistle literature and things like that that were written before then. The thing about going back to Acts chapter 2 is, uh, as I explained, or at least I asserted, and I think you grasp, is they're asking, what must I do? That's language that relates to service. They are convicted by the message, and they want to receive the blessing of the new covenant, the kingdom, all of that type of stuff like that. And they want to be in service, and they want to be in right relationship with God, so they want to do something. But the fact is, they already believed positionally. They believed the message that Peter said, and the doing is a separate act. And and so just like you, you believe the Church of Christ, what they say, and then you set up an appointment to get baptized. No. They're not they're not the same event. No, I don't do that. Okay. All right. Uh, we don't set up appointments. If someone calls me tonight, like the, the area I preach at, they call me mm -hmm. at one o'clock in the morning and they and they want to be baptized, hey, we go then. Right. Okay. But you still gotta go. You the belief oh, yeah. the belief occurs before the baptism. That's yep. my whole point. That's what I call positional belief. Your belief causes you to be baptized. Just like in the Old Testament, your belief caused you to offer a sacrifice. But offering the sacrifice did not save you. It was just a response to what God wanted you to do for service. So I don't believe the Church of Christ really believed that water baptism saves them. I think that they have uh, just haven't uh, analyzed this closely. Oh. No, I, I actually believe you do have to be baptized. But see, some people say believer's baptism, and I, I necessarily don't uh, disagree with that. But see, in the denominational world, when you say a, a believer in the sense, 
you can have a, a, a believer as in someone is, is starting to believe, that are a believer in that sense, Mark 16, 16. But also the, the Bible teaches about believers are the ones that have obeyed that. So in today's Okay, okay time, so what passage would you say that, uh, that you have to be uh, obeyed to be saved? Okay. Well, OB, uh, you could go to, I mean, for, you could go, what is it, John? Well, we just hit, he, use Hebrews 5 9. Okay. But you would say, you would say that's experiential, right? Probably so. Yeah, that's usually my oh, default. I'm, I'm not used to this. I shouldn't ask you, I guess. No, question. no, no, it's all right. You're asking good questions, though. Um, it's fine. Um, yeah, you're right. I, that's That would be my answer. Do you have a counter to that? No, I would just disagree that that's experiential. So, yeah, I mean, the way well, why I'm do you to, why do you think it's not experiential? Okay, so are you saying experiential is basically anything that someone does after they're saved, right? Yes. Yeah, yes. Okay. So, um, well, because in Hebrews five nine it says he's the author of eternal salvation to all them that obey him. So therefore, right. eternal you're... salvation, eternal salvation is not positional. There, that's referring to messianic millennial salvation and inheritance. And so he, it's the saying is that they're not going to get into the promised land inheritance unless they're obedient to him. Okay. Well, from from many of the hours I, I watched you, we have a big. Uh, uh, disagreement on uh, uh i guess you're you you're, all 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 you're all millennial i understand right yeah. you think you think the promised land is a picture of heaven right right and and some of the things you're talking about is basically you can go to heaven but you just don't get certificates and awards and things like that well i'm talk i'm talking about the kingdom um but okay so did moses get to go into the promised land while he was physically alive no he 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 uh, disobeyed do you believe that moses is in hell well, I think the Old Testament does show some pictures, but um, I wouldn't say that he's in hell um, through many, several different examples and individuals like even Abraham and, and he had lied and Lot and many of the other ones. So I think the Old Testament is for our learning, but it never, um, I mean, I'm not going right. to Well, Well, uh, yeah, you're going broader concerning other people, but this is the point is that if Moses did not get to go into the promised land, but yet he physically died that the, and he didn't go to hell, then that shows you that the promised land is not a picture of heaven. It's related to their inheritance. That was the whole purpose for bringing the Israelites into the promised land so that they could live uh, victoriously, reap the blessings and all of that. And in, uh, in premillennialism, we believe that the Abrahamic covenant guarantees Israel will get the land and Jesus Christ will rule and be a blessing to the earth. And so that's how I understand Hebrews 5, 9 in that context. And let me just jump in again. So the, the, what you said, I appreciate the uh, statement, Charles, and then try and wrap it up with a question. Travis, it's okay to have clarifying questions, of course. And then Charles, just make sure you're kind of leading the way, right. though, with question after question. Go ahead. Okay. All right. So <laughs> my, next, my next question is, what other passage would you say obedience is necessary for salvation? That what is? Obedience is necessary for salvation. What other passage would you use? Was it John 3.36? Okay. And that's in the same chapter that you brought up. Right. And and so I have John 3.36, 3, 3, and uh, we can talk about it. But why do you think that this says that you have to be obedient to be saved? Uh, based uh, Because of what John 3.36 says. Well, when you, when you, when you read it, of course... <clears throat> When you read even about faith and you understand faith in Hebrews 11 and faith is trusting and basically the hope the Bible teaches in the sense that when you trust someone, you, you obey. And then John 3, 36, he who believes in the son has eternal life. Would you would you think that that's heaven? E eternal life in John 3 in this passage we're looking at right now. Yeah, the, yeah. The, yeah that's heaven. Yes. Yes, it's heaven. All right, finally, a verse that yeah. I don't have to go through premillennial and try to show. No, no, that's fine. Okay. But but this so, is the thing, that this is showing you that believe and obey are both used synonymously, and so both are positional. They're two ways of saying the same thing. 
Yeah, that's okay. I agree with that. So when you believe and obey, when when whenever you see the word obey and the passages in the Bible that says forgiveness, remission, salvation, saved, mm-hmm. whatever is connected to, to those, God is requiring. Well, those. you you have a problem if you go that route, because like, for example, the command to the Philippian jailer was believe on the Lord Jesus to be saved. The moment you believe that statement, you're saved. So all the other obedience that you're talking about is experiential obedience. It's not positional obedience. It's experiential obedience. Well, we could review the Philippian jailer, but well, well, we can eventually. But the the other thing is, is that well, we we go into the word studies about this stuff about the word for obey and how it's used and things like that. But what I'm trying to establish is there is a basis for positional obedience because every command has an implied you. And then second of all, there's a distinction between experiential obedience. Even in your own experience, whenever someone wants to get baptized, they're telling you they believe and they and you all do the best you can to go baptize that person. But it's still a temporal distance between the belief and the actual uh, next event of baptism. And that is experiential obedience. That is not positional obedience. Okay. Well, you just made a statement so i don't right i uh how much time i have left for questions okay all right so let me just put it this way do you believe that if that you can fall from heaven once you get to heaven that is actually something that many years ago i began to think about and uh and as you study and you look at the bible there was someone in heaven that actually did fall uh wouldn't you agree you're talking about lucifer right yeah, well, I call it the Satan. I think. Okay, Lucifer. all right, but he's an angel. He's not a human, and salvation was not offered. So he fell from a position of service. He didn't fall from a position of salvation. Is your view of salvation really tied to uh, Lucifer losing his position and Judas losing his position? Well, uh, I was I was going to more elaborate a little bit on Satan when um, when you think about and you said. He he actually is 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 he going to be in hell? I believe in a literal lake of fire. Yeah. You, so Satan is actually going to be in hell. Yeah. Okay. Well, you said he just fell from service, and there was basically so right he, because but, he, he didn't have salvation. The only way angels could have salvation is if Christ became an angel and died at their substitute. But he only died for humans, so angels cannot have salvation, and therefore they can't lose salvation. They can only lose their position of service. <clears throat> okay, I, is it not Jude that kind of explains how did Satan fall? What did he do? Well, there's a, there's a couple passages concerning it, but how he fell doesn't change the fact. Yeah, he fell by disobedience and pride, but he fell from a position of service. You can't say that he was saved and lost his salvation because he had no savior. No one died for him. It, no, it violated okay. the doctrine of substitution. Let me let me explain instead of me trying to make you think about my answer and then answering it. So uh, he actually left heaven, right? Yeah, or kicked out, however you want okay. to say it. Go ahead. So when when I get to go to heaven in James chapter 1, 14 through 16, I believe, where it talks about uh, every man is tempted by his own lust and desires and and brings when when uh, gives into temptation, it brings forth sin, and when sin is full grown, it brings forth death. I might have missed yeah. a couple words there, but you know what I I'm got talking you. about. Yeah. Well, I don't believe that there's going to be any temptation in heaven so therefore i don't think that i could sin because he actually left heaven and so that would be my answer for that but we'll find out when we get okay there. so your argument is is that because there's no temptation you can't fall right well james says you can't you can't sin without temptation okay all right so adam and eve in the garden even though they had no sin nature at that time and they had a tempter so you're right in, in the millennial view, Satan is bound for a thousand years, yet people are still able to tempt because you believe in some form of a sin nature, right? You believe that you have a sin nature, right? No. Uh, I'm not talking about Catholic original sin. Why do yeah. you sin? Let me ask you that question. Why would, do you I, personally I, sin? Well, we call it human nature. Okay. We're, we're okay. Mad. That, that's fine. I'll accept that. So if you sin, who's responsible? The individual. So can you tempt yourself to sin? Can I tempt myself? 
Well, it, it, it also says uh, his own desires. So you have to have that, and you're the one responsible for either giving in to the temptation or not, but you have to have some kind of desire. And when we have a new body, see, we're made up of flesh and blood, and we have brains, and this new body's never described. So I can't go into a lot of detail because I don't have the new body at talks well, about. Well, let me ask you a question. What was the temptation for Satan when he chose to fall and from heaven? Well, well, he left, and then it was, it was probably, uh, is it not pride? No, no, no. He had to be tempted to rebel. And so your argument is doing this. You're saying you'll be safe in heaven because there won't be any temptation. But yet Satan was not safe in heaven because evidently he fell, even though no one tempted him. Because James says God cannot tempt nor be tempted. So God could not have tempted Satan and therefore Satan could not have fell based on temptation. So temptation in and of itself is not the basis for failure or loss of salvation. So you think someone uh, can sin without a law or temptation? I'm, I'm saying that, that we as humans... We have we sin, we make a choice to sin, and others humans in this world make choices to sin, and they can entice us. And then we have Satan, who is the god of this world, who manipulates all of these things concerning that to entice us, to lure us, to influence us, but he doesn't force us. So if you have Satan bound and you have a human with no sin nature, uh, or no with a glorified body, I'll put it that way, there's no way a person can fall. But in my system, we're guaranteed to get a glorified body. According to Romans 8, it, it says we're glorified. You can make the argument that we're already positionally glorified. But regardless, Philippians 3.21 says we will get a glorified body that is conformed to Jesus Christ. And that is the basis for why we are eternally secure. Okay. Well, I think some of it is somewhat of a slippery slope that you're going into about this argumentation about heaven and we'll get a new body and what why can't we sin when we're uh, are you saying we're not going to get a new body no i'm saying we are but we're not in heaven we we haven't experienced right we're not that. in heaven yet but my point is is if you use a passage or an event that describes something that happens before salvation was ever needed on earth and then you try to use that same idea to argue for why you won't fall from your salvation once you get to heaven you really messed up because you've assumed so much there. And that's what I'm trying to bring out. It seems like your basis of salvation is how you view God's relationship to Satan and not how God relates his relationship to his sons. Well, I used I used him because uh, not many people have been in heaven. So he's about the only type uh, that we can see that's been in heaven. So that's why I was using him. But but what is heaven without salvation? There was no salvation. Jesus Christ had not died. Uh, and, and once again, Jesus Christ cannot die for an angel. Charles, yes, sir. I'm not sure if you could see the bottom of the screen when I tell you how much time you have left. No, I you're, don't you're, see. Oh, no, that's fine. Okay, you got between three and four minutes left to, to lead okay. the way. So, so are okay. there any other passages that you want to talk about that you believe uh, show that one has to obey to be saved? Yeah, well, you, you have three, I mean, two right there. I think even though obedience is not mentioned, you still have Acts chapter 2, and I do not believe in the context those guys had had their sins washed away in Acts what, 2.38. What, what do you mean by sins washed away? What kind of sins? Well, they were, they were uh, preached about how they uh, killed the Messiah. Okay. So that, that is a sin. They killed the Christ. So just because they already believed and they want something to do, you see ritual washings all throughout the Old Testament where people did it as a response that was like just sort of like circumcision. They did it to say, you know, I'm recognizing I'm in service for God. Jesus Christ got baptized for, for the beginning of his service. So why is it surprising that people that are sinful, unlike Jesus Christ, also get baptized for their service? So it's not for salvation, it's for their service. 
And that's what we talk about baptism. It's a time to recognize you're dedicating yourself to service for that because you're saying that it, it ties to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That just as he died for you at the cross and you're united with him, you can now resurrect to new life and your walk and apply it. And you're declaring that to everybody else in a confession that uh, in, in that way. So I once again argue, and I don't believe Church of Christ believe that water baptism is necessary for salvation. It's necessary in their view for experiential sanctification. That, that's because you're coming at it as these guys have got to be saved. and so Which guys have to be saved? The Jews. In Acts 2.37, they no, have they to get, be saved. They can get saved the moment they say, what must we do? There's a difference between the word do and believe. You agree with that, right? Yeah, you, there's, there's two different okay. Greek words there. All right, but. so you know the difference between do and believe. So when someone tells you to do something, that means to perform a particular action. If someone tells you to believe something, it's still an activity, a positional activity, but it's in the thought realm. It's not in the activity realm in the sense of uh, with your hands or things like that. Question, Charles, make sure you're wrapping up your thoughts yeah. with the question. My, la my last question, is there any other passages that you believe teach that uh, obedience is necessary for salvation? Well, Matthew 7, 21, through that context as well. Why does that passage uh, teach that obedience is necessary for salvation? Here, let me turn over and read it. Or you can pull it up. That's all right. Go ahead. You can read it. <clears throat> well. Now, Jesus says, not everyone saith to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth, that's that word you're talking about, doing right, the will right. of my Father. So the will I, of God, I take I take that passage as experiential sanctification. The kingdom of heaven is not heaven. It's the Messianic and millennial kingdom. So that's not, that's a passage related to experiential obedience. So it's you don't not, think the kingdom's here. Right. The kingdom's not here. Well, Okay, I can't ask you questions, but I'd like for you to explain something here in a minute. Sure, sure, no problem. Gentlemen, why don't we wrap it up there? Because that's basically 25 minutes. Okay. And so very enjoyable uh, first half of the 50-minute cross-examination. We've also got a very uh, lively chat as well with a ton of questions for the Q&A period. Okay, we're jumping into the second portion of this cross-exam, Travis. You now get to lead the way for 25 minutes. Go ahead. Okay, we'll start out with Mark 9, 1. Since uh, you brought up the kingdom, I do have a bunch of questions. And, and I'll read it. It says, and he said unto them, Verily I say unto you that there be some of them that stand here. So there's some of them that standing there at that time, about 2,000 year years ago, which shall not taste death. Okay, he says, there's some of you standing here that will not die. That's tasting death. Till they have seen seen the kingdom of God come with power. So my question is, Mark says there's some of them standing there that will see the kingdom. You said it hadn't come. So can you explain that verse uh, real briefly? Yeah, the transfiguration is a foreshadowing of what's going to happen in the ultimate future because you have Moses and Elijah that appear. You have the, the, the disciples that are like the earthly saints. And this all this is why they made the statement about the three tabernacles, which you go to Zechariah chapter 14 is where you have one Lord. The Feast of Tabernacles is going to be kept again in the Gentile nations and all that. So what Jesus did was he gave them an image about the kingdom coming in power because the king, Jesus is the king. But three things have to exist for the kingdom to be enforced. Number one, the king has to be in place. Number two, he has to be in the realm of the land. And number three, he has to be really ruling. The thing is that based on the covenants, Israel has to accept his offer and Jesus Christ cannot come back until they accept the offer. So that even though he showed them the picture in the transfiguration, they will not be able to accept the kingdom until they come uh, to salvation in the tribulation whenever they believe uh, in him and call on him Hosanna to be saved from the Antichrist. Okay. And um, since... Cross exam. Can, I'm going to answer a little bit of that. You said that you must have the, a king ruling. Well, I believe it's Acts 2 where uh, Christ ascended to heaven and he's sitting on the right hand of God. So he is on throne. So king, the king is ruling. He must have a territory. Well, his t the territory is uh, basically 
the world and he's ruling or the church, the kingdom, the church of Christ. And then you said he's got to have, what was the other one? He's got to be really ruling. Really ruling? Yes, really ruling. Okay, well, I think he is ruling through right. his word. But see, what you're doing is when you read in scripture, you'll see that there's times whenever it talks about an eternal kingdom. And there's times when it's talking about a temporal kingdom, just like I have my chart in three columns. When you're talking about the kingdom, you got to recognize that there's an eternal aspect. There's a temporal aspect. There's a God that always rules sovereignly. And there's a meditorial rule that he rules through humans. Okay. There's a kingdom related to the land. And then there's a kingdom related to all of his creation. OK. OK, let me let me I don't want to get off on the, on the kingdom and, and uh, the end. We're, we're talking about biblical salvation. We're putting the what's the saying? We're putting the uh, the horse. Well, the I, I think I think your passages right. about salvation have been affected by your amillennialism okay. because you yeah. adopted allegorical let me, interpretation. Let me ask you a question: uh, Is the Bible necessary for someone to be saved? The the Bible is the word of God. Faith comes by hearing. You know, typical thing, and the Holy Spirit illuminates the word. So yes. Okay. okay. Yes. Must a preacher be necessary for someone to be saved? Someone has to uh, someone has to share the word or they have to read the Bible for themselves. Yes. OK. All right. Can you give a scripture reverence for. Uh, well, we'll skip that one because. OK. Can you give an example of a lost person, what they did to be saved after Jesus sent out the gospel preachers? Well, um well, uh, I, you know, I why can't I just go to? Let me think. Um, no, I can't. I'm just going to say no, I can't right now, and let's okay. see what let's see what happens. All right. Well, I mean, I'm not, I'm going to keep going through. Uh, if I do a review, I'll uh, make sure I bring that out. Do you agree to obtain? Do you agree that to obtain Bible authority, one must use a command, an example, implication? And when they have one of those three, they can use expediency. Do you kind of agree with that? I understand what you're arguing in. And you're basically saying, you know, where scriptures are silent, we're silent. And those type of approaches like that. There's implicit arguments. There's explicit arguments. There's several different ways to motivate somebody to do something. That relates to speech act theory. Um, okay. So go ahead. I, I'll concede it for right now. I'll backtrack if I need to. Do you, do you believe one must, can one use silence to gain Bible authority? It just depends on uh, it depends on your claim of silence. OK, I mean, if the Bible, if the Bible is silent about a certain area, can one insert whatever they think that they want to when the Bible is silent on it and get and continue? Like, for if, example, if you could establish that the intent of the of the text was for you to fill in the blanks, then, yeah, you could do that. But you would have to go to a long link to be able to do that. OK. Um. Well, do you uh, do you basically believe in hell, and how does one get into hell? A person gets to <laughs> hell. Question, but... <laughs> yes, I believe in hell, and a person goes to hell whenever they never believe in Jesus Christ. Okay. Well, what passage would you use to teach someone about hell? Well, I would probably just use uh, John three eighteen. This is the condemnation, uh, you know, uh, that men have love darkness, and basically, he that does not believe is condemned already. And passages like that, and so I would relate it to John three sixteen because it mentions not perish and stuff like that. But I would probably use the exact same passage as you would. Well, um, well, I don't know about that, but uh and and John chapter 3 you have the context is basically from verse 1 to verse 21 would you agree with that as a as a uh close uh within the context before um sure I'll, I'll I'll grant that for now go ahead okay so as as if the viewers would actually read chapter 3 all the way th through you see in verse 21 can you can you explain this it says but uh no let me let me get to this um is okay, Charles. Is practice a one time thing? Here's an example Tommy practices his jump shot. Is that a one time action? If you're using the practice word in that way, no, it's not a one time action. Okay, well, I would want people to actually read verse 21. Because you know, I did, I did watch a lot of your stuff, Charles, and you got me digging into the Greek. 
And, yeah, and sometimes you can't, just because uh, it may say a present tense doesn't refer to it, it's always ongoing, but um, the ETH, why do you not think that that actually is showing a present the, tense indicative? The, the ETH is, the, is indicating the third person personal ending. But the but the but the uh, the the syntactical category, the verbal aspect, those things like that are coming from contextual factors, and not and not it's not in necessarily embedded within the English verb system. Okay, I, I want to. I would. Uh, I'm, oh, well, let me put it this way: yeah. the form does not indicate continuous action. It just indicates that it's a third person, a uh, singular pronoun at the end of the verb. Okay. Now I have a question too. With John chapter three, you use I believe it's Numbers twenty one, where they had to look at the serpent and live. Um, could they sit in their tent and believe, or did they actually have to go and look, and that was accounted to their faith and action? They had to look because that was the requirement. But once again, that's an experiential sanctification passage that's applied by the audience to a positional truth related to Christ's sacrifice and belief on that. Okay, do you believe God is just? Yes. Do you believe in free will? Yes. Got a question for you. Okay, um, how would you help this individual or even see that God is just? Let's say a man, he, he, loved, uh, he loved a woman more than anything, more than his children, his job, and even God. And he got saved, according to you, your view, and his wife never got saved. And she died. And she never got saved, so she went to hell. This man actually wanted to go to hell to be with his wife. Is there anything he can do to go be with her? Or basically, does God kidnap him and make him go to heaven? Once you believe, you're locked in. Because the Bible says that we're predestined to be conformed to the image of his glory. So when you believe, you're locked in and you're going to glorify body. So he can't go to hell if he's believed the gospel, just like you can't go to hell if you get to heaven. And you said that earlier because there's no temptation. So you can try to go to hell. I'm not telling you to go to hell, but I'm telling you you'll be stuck in heaven. Okay. All right. Now, you stated in your video that one has to be baptized. In Galatians 3.27, you referenced that. Right. Spirit baptism is not for uh, the thing to understand about spiritual baptism is you had believers that were placed into the body of Christ because of the Holy Spirit ministry of baptism never occurred before because the body of Christ never occurred before. And so you have believers that were placed into a new structure. Now it's retroactive for when we believe we're automatically placed into the body of Christ and therefore it's positional retroactive positional truth. OK, so. With that, I never stated that if it was water baptism or Holy Spirit baptism. If Holy Spirit baptism seems to be the baptism that everybody gets, why didn't you just assume that it was Holy Spirit baptism? Because it doesn't mention water. Okay, but you just but you just assumed that I was talking about water, even though everybody may makes this claim that's holy Spirit. well after watching your debates i noticed something you basically said you everybody wants to talk about being in christ and there's no condemnation in christ and you're covered by the blood in christ but then i noticed that you always say no one could tell you how to get in christ and then you use galatians and you read it like water and i started realizing you believe that you use water baptism okay. to get into christ and that's how the blood is applied in your system now, now, would you somewhat maybe think about changing your stance on baptism if Galatians 3.27 was actually water? Maybe. Let's read it. Uh, read it to me with that idea. Let's just hear what it says about water baptism. Well, well, I, I don't, I don't want to re read it. Okay, that's right. fine. But yeah, maybe, maybe. Okay. I haven't thought about the implications of it. But you know what? If water baptism is what God designs for people to be saved and that's what the text teaches, then that's what I will believe and that's what I will teach. I don't have any obligations to anything. I want a worship of God of truth. Could could you actually uh, agree if you held this view, you could actually go ahead and put it with your chart as positional obedience and use it as a synecdoche showing that biblical saving faith includes baptism, right? No, you couldn't. The reason being is because a belief is a thought act and water baptism is something you do with your hands that involves other people. And there's a temporal event distinction between those two events. So it's impossible to put it in a positional category. 
Okay. I would have to say that even believing, as you said, involves a Bible or a preacher or you reading it. That's a pre-preparatory process that occurs before the actual point where you believe the gospel. Even in your stairs, you have here before belief. People that hear don't believe. It's a distinct event. Okay. Can you give me an example of how you were baptized with the Holy Spirit? When did no. that happen? Retroactive positional truth is not experience. It's what we know from scripture by faith. The beginning of the church age was based on the promise that the Holy Spirit will be in you and dwell with you forever. And in Acts 2, it talks about waiting for the promise of the Holy Spirit. And we see from Acts 10 how that happened as well as that. So it's based on scripture that we believe that the body of Christ came and existed at. Ephesians 3, Colossians 1 talk about that the mystery that it didn't exist in any other time before that. So this is a new creation, okay. a new entity that came into existence. Okay. So just real quick, where you won't take a lot of time, did you, you, when I ask you, can you give me an example of when you were baptized with the Holy Spirit? Did you say no? Yes, but, uh, but I can tell you what scripture says about it. Okay, I'll I can, get to that. I can get tell to you that. that the Bible says in Ephesians, when I believed, I was sealed with the Spirit. Uh, I can tell you that I was indwelt with the Spirit. And so that's where Christ is indwell you, where a spirit baptism is where you're placed into Christ. Two different okay. words. Let me let me ask you a question now. Now, uh, if you if you want to really be a, a good uh, friend of mine, Charles, remind me to come back to Holy Spirit baptism. But you went to Ephesians chapter 1. What is it? Verse 14, right? Something like that. Yeah. Okay. Can you tell me that were these actually the Ephesians were converted and became Christians? In yes, the book of so Acts? they're believers. They're saints. No, where, what chapter, book and verse in the book of Acts did these people from, become From Christians? memory, uh, I would probably say around Acts 18 or something. They were caught up in sorcery for several years, but that doesn't mean they weren't saved. Okay. Do you, do you have the Holy Spirit just like they did in the Bible times? I have the same Holy Spirit, but I don't have the same spiritual gifts. Okay. Well, in Bible times when they had the Holy Spirit, and uh, you claim that you have the Holy Spirit literally inside of you, and, and um, do you still do have, the you have the Holy Spirit inside of you? Let me finish asking my question. Um, in um, the book of John, I think in verse 16 or, or 14, he says basically... Um, that all things will come to your remembrance. Do you have it to that degree? No, he, that's a specific promise to the apostles and prophets that is not referring to this post-canon church age that we live in. Okay. Well, in, in Ephesians that you're using for the viewers, you um, you get you need to turn up, turn your Bible with me to Acts chapter 19. All right? I have some questions for you in 19. In Acts chapter 19, Paul is at Ephesus, and... He writes later on to Ephesians. Now, you stated that the book of Acts was written later or during uh, maybe after the epistles, but it's still recording history before that. So I don't think that's really a good argument. But in verse 4 and 5, it says that when Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe on, in him that is coming after me, that is on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And notice in verse 6, did 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 you experience verse 6, Charles? Read to me verse 6. Oh, I thought you was turning over there with me. No. Okay. Um, well, let me share my Bible, I guess. Well, it's all right. I'll get it. It just takes a second. Well, Donnie, can you still share it? You talk, uh, Absolutely, yeah. I, I think because you removed the share screen, Travis, you have to um, click yeah, the present I, again. I, I'll put it back in there. Oh, there it is. Yeah. All right, I want the viewers to see this as well. Now, uh, he brought up Ephesians, and these the, the Ephesians were already members of the Church of Christ, and he brought up Ephesians 1, uh, 14, where you're sealed with the Holy Spirit. Did you actually experience this right here, Charles? The, the receiving of the Holy Spirit by hand? Yes. Yeah. No. All right, so you didn't receive that, but you actually want to use their letter, thinking that somehow you received the Holy Spirit and it sealed you. But no, you no, you're not. It. You're not recognizing why these people uh, received the Spirit in this way. And the Paul laid hands on the Holy Spirit, came on them, and began speaking in tongues and prophesying. The reason they received that Spirit in that way, so they had the ability to speak in those type of particular gifts. 
That's not talking about salvation. That's talking about service. And it's talking about apostolic commission and authority. And also the distinctions and transitions between Israel, Samaritans, John's disciples, and things like that. The book of Acts is a transitional book. And just as you made an argument a while ago that it's historical and you should start with Acts 2 and work your way forward and relate it to the epistles, I'm doing the very same thing. Okay, let's say you, you brought up Ephesians here. And do you have the spirit of wisdom and full knowledge? No, I do not. Okay, well, when people actually start reading these letters, you will see this is only a couple verses up. So this is miraculous, and we saw yeah, the other thing on the hands. So but your, ar your, your argument, you're given verses. This is what charismatics do. They try to argue for the spiritual gifts by pointing to scriptures that talk about the spiritual gifts before the Bible has been completed. But there's a there's you could trace a uh, and, and Church of Christ agree with this. You could trace a progression of the dying out of the sign gifts and the revelatory gifts, but the service gifts and the communication gifts continue. And also, you're conflating the ministry of the Holy Spirit with spiritual gifts. The sealing, the indwelling, the regeneration are personal ministries of the Holy Spirit. They're not the same thing as given gifts of the Holy Spirit that we have the responsibility to exercise ourselves. I can't exercise the indwelling. I can't exercise the baptism. I can't enter, okay, exercise right. the filling. That's, that, that's, that's a while. So uh, th a lot of this is you're, you're assuming, though. What is the danger of a false well, teacher? Well, what are you assuming? Let me ask you this question. What is the danger of a false teacher to a Christian? Lots of things. Well, can you give one example? If, if a Christian is a believer, uh, a false teacher is in danger of keeping them in bondage and them losing out on rewards and then therefore leaving seem divine discipline and missing out on their purpose in life. So it's just physical life, like that's the danger of a false teacher? It's physical life if that's all you care about. If you just care about getting to heaven and staying there, hopefully unlike Lucifer, then yeah. If you want to reduce in an immature perspective that all that matters is is heaven instead of your responsibility to be faithful now so the Lord can reward you later on with greater faithfulness, then yeah, you could take that approach, but it's carnal and selfish, and it's no different than the Exodus generation that made a golden calf. Okay, well, I don't know how you're trying to take my views carnal when you're actually talking about the rewards is all about how, how much no, we get No, no. If, if scripture talks about rewards, then that's a God-given motivation. So what you're calling carnal, you're calling scripture carnal. So no, I don't I'm think you should go that way. Are I'm you saying you don't believe in rewards at all? Are you saying you don't believe in rewards at all? I think he's oh, is that just is that just on my end, or did um, Travis freeze up? He froze. He might have froze. Okay, well I'll start the timer there, or stop the timer. For now, we've got exactly. You guys hear me now? You're back. Yes, yeah, you're, back, you're back, Travis. All right. Go ahead. I guess I guess that was maybe part of my punishment for being a false teacher. Um, what is the definition of fellowship? The word fellowship can be partnership. It could be just fellowship. I say there's three main categories, spiritual, social, and doctrinal. Okay. Uh, it could be positional, experiential, and ultimate as well. Can one go to heaven without the blood of Jesus? You mean if you believe the gospel and the gospel includes believing in Jesus Christ? No. So you have to you have to somehow have the blood of Jesus uh, redeemed by the blood of Jesus on your account, right? Yes. Okay. Well, First John chapter one verses five through seven. Uh, the reason why I bring this, I already know where you're going. If you want me to just answer and make it short for you, he may have froze well, again. All right. Well, I'm going to answer anyway. He, first John's about fellowship. He's going to argue that you got to walk in the light. Otherwise, the blood of Christ is not applied to you. Walking in the light is obedience. A water baptism is applied by the blood. The problem with that argument is that Jesus Christ died 2,000 years ago, and he died for the whole world. So er, he died for the penalty for everybody. Now, the problem is, is that unbelievers won't receive his righteousness and his eternal life. That's what gets them into heaven. The, the issue, the blood's already been dealt with, and it has results. They have continuous cleansing for fellowship, but that's an additional uh, uh, benefit of atonement. Okay. 
Well, there's some things that you said there that you're you're actually misrepresenting again. In First John one seven, doesn't bring up baptism, and I'm not I'm not even talking about baptism here. I think it's what does written, walking in the light wait, mean? Wait, wait, it's, a, it, it's written to Christians, so this would be how God wants us to stay faithful. Once we I agree, but what does walking in light mean in this passage to you? It means exactly what it says. It walking means obedience. Light. It means it obedience, means right? No, no, it means practice. Okay, practice what? Obedience, right? You're just trying to use the word obedience to read baptism into everything. You are using a reductionistic approach to read water baptism and everything. And the thing is, is that you don't have one passage that includes the whole gospel. You would have to have the whole entire canon of scripture to come to your system. And, and you're reading it like a systematic theology. No, and that's I not think, practical because none, actually, of, none of these scriptures. Happens, actually, I think what happens is people can read this and they can they can understand it for themselves, Charles. Don't you think so? Well, this is the thing. You're not counting for the progressive revelation. All these people did not have the same content. And you're hopping around to get these verses to try to build your staircase of salvation. So you but you know what? Around. There's decades where one staircase didn't exist or concepts within it. And so your whole system is just an assumption that water baptism is the way that you get into Christ, get the blood applied and all of that. And I'm telling you, just well, look, I'm not, I'm, I'm not trying to take the baby from the bathwater. You can have your bathwater, but put it in the experiential column and understand you became a baby when you believed in Jesus Christ. So you believe this is experiential because you keep saying that, but it actually says no. The, 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 the purpose the statement, Jesus, the purpose, the purpose Christ. statement for First John says these things are written that you may have fellowship with us. When you say to the fellowship, it's talking about doctrinal fellowship, spiritual That's fellowship, and the blood of Jesus Christ. Can, the blood of Jesus Christ still has right. the That's blood of Jesus Christ. Right. Can you moderate SFT? Okay, I'm, I'm going to stop you both right there. I want to have Travis repeat his question and then Charles try and respond since there was a little crosstalk there the last 30 seconds. Travis, okay. go ahead, reiterate your question or ask a new one, however you'd like to proceed. And then Charles, okay. uh, take questions. as much time as you need. All right. If a man is saved, is a man saved by living faith or by dead faith? A man is saved by positional faith. Okay, that's not what I ask. I ask, is it is a is it a living faith or a dead faith? What is the definition of a living faith? Uh, well, I mean, a living faith is an active faith, and a dead person is a dead person. So, I mean, it's so not if you if you believe the gospel and that results in eternal life, would you consider that a living faith? It's part of it. Okay, so that's a positional living faith. Okay, what about if that person already has believed? Can he, can he, can his faith, does it, does it cease or does he still have faith? No, it, uh, his positional faith will never, never cease in the sense of the results of eternal life never cease, but his experiential faith can cease. So he has two faiths. No, it's the same kind of faith, but it's applied as it relates to sanctification. So the idea being is that the faith doesn't change. It's the object that changes. So God is the object of salvation, but he's also the object of sanctification. So when you're talking about a living faith experientially, you're talking about following God in sanctification, which is what First John is talking about right there, walking in the light as he's in the light. Okay. How many times was Abraham? Would you believe uh, if the Bible says someone is justified? How many times was Abraham justified? Yeah. Uh depends which passage you're talking about. I think you made the argument three, but is it positional justification or is it experiential justification? No, I'm saying how many times does the Bible say? That he was justified, the word? Yeah. I don't know. Tell me, three maybe? How many okay. times? Uh, well, the, the Bible actually would, actually the Bible would say two times directly and one time by implication, but is justified meaning you're just, if I never sin, you're saved, you're declared righteous? It depends on the context. Positional justification is where you're declared righteous, where you receive Christ's imputed righteousness. Experiential justification is where you do a right thing when you're in fellowship with God and the God declares it, rewards it, recognizes it for what it is. All right. Uh, does faith involve knowledge, Charles? Faith, if you mean faith in the sense that you believe in a proposition, then yes. Okay. How do we get faith? 
One minute left, by the way. As we are end. made. We are made in the image of God. This means we have the ability to represent them. This means we have the ability to make decisions and choices. And so, therefore, we look at the objects and we evaluate and we we uh, whether it's an object of truth or an object we sit on, and then we determine whether we're going to believe in that or not. So, belief does not come from God in the sense of like the Calvinists. It's innate within the ability because we're in the image of God. Okay. One last question, Travis. One last question. Well, for the for the viewers to think about, Charles is a nice guy, and I appreciate him. But actually, I have there's no real consequences for what I'm teaching. So I think, why don't you, Charles, just jump on with me and be my brother in Christ? What? Why do you think that there's no consequences for what you're teaching? I'm not understanding that. I think he. Fr I think he froze up right at the. Yeah, he needs so to get he's better. Leaving he us in get, suspense with that final. He needs question. to get better internet. That's a consequence. Let's see if he makes his way back in the next few seconds. I think he will. Yeah. Sorry about that, guys. I got a bunch of kids over there probably stealing all my internet. I actually have like 200 download megabyte speed 5G. So I don't know why it's doing that. Well, you've been great for 99% of the debate. It's just the last few minutes. So that's fine. Did you, Travis, did you want to reiterate your last question or point there? Just so we, we have a, a complete cross exam yeah. for you. Well, some of it's just, I want to just lighten up people and, and understand that. Well, when he said, what's the consequences? Uh, there's really no major consequences because you, you would get to go to heaven anyway. So that was kind of my point, just a little bit. But what, what was it a major? Was it a yeah? Was it a major consequence when Moses died and didn't get to go into the promised land? Yeah, there was a consequences with him. Okay. But, well, I believe that the Lord disciplines people. I believe He can kill people. I believe that you lose rewards and you can lose that out of ruling and reigning with Him. For a thousand years. Those are eternal consequences. Okay. Gentlemen, excellent discussion. Some good, healthy back and forth uh, in that 50 minute cross exam portion. And you both came prepped. I appreciate all the question uh, questions and answers, all the points discussed. Very comprehensive, and 50 minutes really did fly by. So we still have concluding statements where uh, you gentlemen get to wrap up your thoughts and your points. And so, Charles, we're going to hand it over to you since you kicked us off tonight. You have five minutes for a closing statement. Whenever you're ready, the floor is yours. Yeah. So for my closing statement, what I want to say is this accusation against one verse is not the true. The understanding of John 3.16 relates to the whole purpose and understanding of the, of the gospel of John, as well as understanding the connections to the Old Testament that's making uh, uh, the comparison from the bronze serpent in that. In addition to that, whenever you're tracing progressive revelation of the study of scripture, you have to ask, what did the people know at that time and what was to be revealed? And see, where we want, to, where I believe that a gospel belief would focus on given promises, and I think you can look at the Samaritan woman, I think you can look at Mary and Martha, I think there are people in the passages of the gospel of John that believe the promise of eternal life. But the reason that that's being told that way is for the purpose of equipping believers to evangelize and everything. And see, what that's saying is that the Gospel of John contains the promise of how you can be saved. But you can't get that from the Church of Christ, stairs a step of salvation. You, you have to start with Acts 2 and build the first step and go through all of that. But what you find out is they're automatically assuming that this stuff is already in existence. And it's not. Because... They, they're, they're basically, what they're doing is they're, they're turning the Bible into a systematic theology where they're hopping around and trying to read all these other texts in. So any statements about walking in the light, uh, obedience, practicing, he's automatically reading it as water baptism. Anytime he introduces a book of the Bible that says they're saints, he says, well, they were water baptized. Well, number one, I've already established in Acts chapter two that they already believed and, and they're wanting to know what to do. So the water baptism in Acts two is not necessarily for positional salvation. So you can't use that as the, the, the crux for understanding all those other passages. Furthermore, the issue that you'd have to run into is if you believe in your not water baptism, are you going to heaven? You know, that's the issue that you got to say about. But even if you get, believe that's a one-time event that's distinct, and even if you get baptized, that's an event that's separated from a temporal realm. Therefore, positional belief is different from experiential baptism, and my argument still stands. 
And so what I would encourage uh, Travis to do is to examine his claims. We could go into detail and I could go into after show about linguistics and grammar and syntax and interpretation and all of that. He watched all those videos, but he didn't make those arguments. I understand he's not seminary trained in the way I am, both informally and formally, but I'm willing to offer that to him. And hopefully his church of Christ can do that because otherwise he believes that he can lose his salvation just by not going to church. And if that's the case, we're all in trouble because he views Judas as the paradigm for his basis of salvation. He believes that Judas lost his salvation and therefore we can lose our salvation. He believes that Satan can lose his salvation and we can lose our salvation. He believes a believer can be possessed, I believe, from other statements we said. Is this the type of basis or assumption that you would base scripture on? He, he what makes a claim like we don't have the Holy Spirit in the same type of way. Well, the Holy Spirit is the same person and dwelling within you. He's just doing a different type of work. That's a distinction between the, the, the ontological trinity and the economic trinity. This is foundational. You know, there's so many uh, theological categories, doctrinal errors that are associated with this. And it's just based on proof texting because he thinks he can't lose his salvation because there's no temptation in heaven. Yet Satan lost his salvation in his view, yet God can't tempt. So how did temptation happen in heaven? The reason being is because an individual can make their own choice whether to fall or not. Lucifer was good by the fact that he was given the good gift of free will and he abused it and that's what sin is. Once you get to heaven because when you believed in Christ, you made a decision with your free will to believe the gospel. That gospel positionally transformed you and guarantees you get a glorified body where you're sealed. That means you're locked in to get born to the glory of Jesus Christ. So you forfeited your decision in eternal uh, in the eternal consequences of things, even though you have not forfeited your decision to make a moment by moment choice in your temporal realm. And if you want to include water baptism in that or some other sacrament or some other thing like that as a relates to sanctification, then that's great. But don't try to say that it's part of positional salvation because you yourself say when someone wants to be baptized, we're recognizing a belief and we're trying to get there as fast as we can so that they can get baptized. That shows you there's a temporal distinction. And just as there's a temporal distinction between the creation of the earth and the creator God, that when one doesn't exist anymore, God still eternally exists. And that's what I'm saying. The basis for the chart is based on time. The basis and the distinction of the kingdom is based on passages that relate to internal and temporal, and as well as God's sovereign reign versus his mediatorial reign and distinctions between the land and the new heavens and new earth. I pray that you look at these distinctions. God bless. Okay, Charles, thank you very much for that five-minute concluding statement. Definitely an engaging and a wild debate tonight. So I want to thank all the audience, especially for all the questions that have come in and all of the uh, feedback. We've still got over 100 people in the live chat enjoying this epic showdown. So, Travis, we're going to hand it over to you now. Whenever sure you're ready, that. you've got we five sure minutes. That. Yeah, you're good. All right, let me go through some of what he said. He sounds like a, a rapper or something. Um, well, uh, Charles didn't even know where the Ephesians had became Christians. This guy, he went to cemetery, seminary school and didn't even know the conversion account of Acts 19 and wants to steal their mail and don't even know how they became Christians. So that's something for the viewers. Uh, when I talk about 1 John chapter 1, I didn't bring up baptism. He brought up baptism, and that's because he can't answer the arguments for baptism. He says, I lost my salvation by not going to church. Well, the members is the church. The church is the called out, the ecclesia, called by the gospel. And I said, I didn't go to worship. Say John 4, 24, we must worship in spirit and truth. And it wasn't in a sense that I was in the military and I was deployed. I was uh, not practicing righteousness when I was in the military. A lot of people don't. Military is really hard to be faithful. He said, I used uh, Judas. I'm actually going to preach on Judas tomorrow. So the good brethren will see that Judas did fall, as it says in Acts chapter 1. Again, he claims that he has the Holy Spirit. Um, and he said, but he didn't know the scripture, so he doesn't have it like they did. And he tried to make like that he does have it like they did, and he didn't even know the scriptures. And so he doesn't have it like them. Um, he says that you he used a bunch of big words, but basically you gotta you gotta wait on the preacher to go baptize someone. But well, let's say if someone wants to believe, you still gotta wait on the preacher to go tell them the gospel or, or teach them. So 
none of that is just faulty arguments. And he spoke so fast and rapped so fast that most people wouldn't catch what he said. I want you guys to look, go check this out. I have some Calvinists that are in the chat. Man, you guys, Trey Fisher is doing the Lord's work by getting on YouTube and talking to Aaron Gallagher. Aaron Gallagher, Charles, actually might be a better person for you because he actually knows Greek. And see, I'm I'm kind of an ignorant country boy, as, as some would put it. And I don't know all these big terms, but I can read the Bible and understand it's pretty simple. He didn't answer Acts chapter 2. He says they're saved. They said, what do we do? And you see right here that they were told to repent and be baptized. So Charles is actually saying that you're saved before you even repent. That's what he's saying. Look at the definition of repent. Before you even change your mind, you're saved. That's what he's saying in Acts chapter 2, friends. See, his, his seminary school is not helping him. He, I hope he kept the receipt so he can get a refund because they're not teaching him biblical principles. I hate to be like that. But notice here, and it says, for the remission of sins. Friends, he didn't bring up the argument about this word ace or ice. He probably would know how to pronounce it. But the Greek scholars say it is in order to. I have the proof right here. I can mail you this stuff. This is what the Greek BDAG says, in order to, for forgiveness. The Greek scholars are saying you repent and you're baptized in order to have the sins removed for forgiveness. But this guy says you're already saved. Why? Because he's preconceived. See, I'm not going to convince uh, Charles. Charles was a really nice guy, but after this, he's going to go. He's going to get with his free grace buddies. They're going to make fun. They're going to say some things that I didn't even say. They're going to say, you have to be in Travis's church. It's not my church. It is the Lord's church. It's the church of Christ. Tune into truth, truth with proof, and you may learn some more biblical teachings. Notice this. He may say, I thought he was going to bring up about the first person or second person, third person. But see, I have other references to answer this. But he didn't bring up this argument. I thought he would. He did in uh, the whole time I watched him uh, review my uh, my uh, uh, dates. But man, Charles, he really put in the work. I'll tell you that. I wish um, um, that he would just see the simplicity of God's word. And he didn't even know I said, give me an example of a conversion account where, you, like, how you were saved like them. And he couldn't give one, friends. I, I would play this if I had more time. I had a guy call in my show one time. I said, how'd you get saved? He says, well, I just felt like uh, the Holy Spirit picked me, like the Bible says. The one Bible minute. Say that. And so we see Bible examples. If you want to go to heaven, and he spent a lot of time, we should have maybe set the debate about can you lose your salvation? because he doesn't even teach salvation right. So I don't think he needs to be worried about how you lose your salvation because he don't even have his salvation according to the Bible. Now, I'm not trying to be mean. And I've watched so many people say, oh, Travis is so rude. And when I first started debating, I was very passive. And what happens is they just talk over you. And the people say, well, you're, you're too passive. And then when you get aggressive, they say, well, you're too rude. And what it comes down to is a lot of people in the, in the chat, they never debated. Until you get on the platform, it's kind of like you're the couch quarterback. Until you get out there, then come and talk to me, all right? Because there's a lot of information going on at once. But I kind of like this chart here that you can actually see the conversion accounts, Ten study seconds. your Bible, and do what the Bible says. Love you guys. Love Charles. Love the viewers. Thanks, Donnie, for having me. Appreciate you guys. My pleasure. Uh, Travis Thomas, thank you so much for that five-minute concluding statement. Gentlemen, I got to say thank you for a debate to remember. I was, uh, it was very engaging. I was thoroughly entertained and it was very thorough. So a lot of points uh, discussed on this important topic, the topic of soteriology. We've basically got enough questions to keep us busy until the same time tomorrow. <laughs> so gentlemen, I hope you guys are ready for about a, uh, a good 24-hour uh, Q&A session. I'm sure they're all for me. It's, you know, you might be on the hot seat tonight, Travis, I'm but we do have a good, uh, just glancing at them. We do have a, a decent mix. Uh, so I'll put a timer on the, the Q and a, we'll say between 25 and 30 minutes and we'll get through as many as we can. Uh, let's give these debaters a one minute break as I go over some reminders and, and announcements here. So to 
Remind the audience, it's it's been another busy, fun week of debates. We've had a solid mix of creation, evolution, and soteriology debate. So we kick-started the week with uh, the continuation in our Evolution Debate Challenge series, Dr. Dino and Fox Official. Definitely a fun one. And then we had a podcast debate for our uh, SFT podcast website. And so myself and Taylor, we debated genetic entropy. So please do check that out. It is officially on the website now, the podcast one that is. And then, of course, last night we had Merritt and John Crawford. They kickstarted our uh, four days, three debates on uh, salvation. And so they debated specifically, though, uh, John 15. What is the proper understanding or exegesis of John 15? Tonight, of course, these gentlemen did not let us down. Ton of fun. Time has flown by, I got to say. And the chat has been very lively. It's been a lot of fun tonight. So Travis Thomas, Charles Jennings, we're taking tomorrow off, but we will be back uh, next week for another uh, slew of great debates. Monday, Turretin Fan and Eli Haytov, same topic, what is true biblical salvation. And then another much anticipated debate here, specifically on dispensationalism, Pastor Matt First, Pastor Anthony Aquino, who are God's true chosen people. So next week is going to be fun. All right, gentlemen, break time's over and the question and answer session begin. So here we go, uh, Travis and Charles. Travis, this is your first time here on the channel. So typically what we do is uh, whoever the question is for, in order that we can move along smoothly, we'll make sure they get the last word, say it's for you. You can respond. Charles, you can respond to whatever you'd like to in terms of the question or anything Travis says, then Travis will get the last word. Okay. Um, where are we going to start here? I guess we'll just start right at the beginning. Ashley Myers has a question for both. Thank you for the question, Ashley. And so she asks, in Luke 8, parable of the seeds that fell, one by the wayside, two on the rock, three among thorns, four and in good ground, which are which of these are saved and why would you say that? Um, anybody want to volunteer in terms of going first since it is the first question? How much? How long do we get to kind of answer their questions? I, I don't like to be too strict because depending on the question could be a harder question to answer or a longer question to answer that is. Let's okay. say, let's try not to keep the, let, let's try and keep it less than two minutes per response. Okay. I'll, I'll go first or I'll be a gentleman. You can go. Don't matter. Travis, yeah, you, no, you go first. Go ahead. All right. Well, I think it's a very good question question Ashley you know through the parables that I think if you go through there's only two uh, parables means throw beside to compare and there's only two that actually Jesus explained so there's no guessing there's no I think it means this this is one of those and it says now the parable uh, the parable of course you, you gave the um, and I, I, I'm reading from Luke chapter 8 it's the wayside all right then you have the rock, the thorns, and the good ground. So the question is, on the rock among the thorns and the good ground, which of these are saved, and why would you say so? Well, I think if you just read it, you see the good ground, friends. And the good ground, is it not? It brings forth, they keep keep the word. See, the 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 seed is the word of God. See, uh, it's the, like the analogy, an apple only produces an apple. Well, the seed produces a Christian, doesn't produce a Baptist or a Methodist. And it is the good ground. You have to be a good and honest heart. And the other ones were believers and they were choked out. Well, one, the two of them was believers and they were choked out and they withered away. And you have to be good ground. So the good ground. Travis, I appreciate the response. Charles, floor is here. I'm going to set a time. Yeah, um, when I'm dealing with these parables, these parables are talking about discipleship. Jesus is preparing his disciples for the fact that people are going to reject the message of the kingdom, which is not the message of salvation. And so he's just talking about the different results that happen. Some people are going to receive you. Some people are going to receive you for a little bit. Some people do that. But uh, it doesn't necessarily refer to positional salvation at all. It's experiential sanctification. 
Okay, uh, gentlemen, that was a question for both. So we got an answer from the both of you, and now we'll we'll move on. So question from Centurion seven three seven. Question for Travis: Why did David in Psalm fifty one twelve ask God to restore the joy of his salvation and not restore his salvation? If he lost salvation, why not ask for it back? Go ahead. Okay, well, Psalms 51 is about a psalm about his sin that he com committed. And he says in verse 2, All right, you can't go to heaven in your sin. And he actually says, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. He says, for I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin. So it was very similar to 1 John chapter 1 where a Christian today has to repent. They have to confess uh, their sins and pray for forgiveness as we see the examples. So I wish you would have just uh, read before it because you got to take it all. You can't just take one verse and, and say, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation when he actually says, wash me, forgive me of my sin. That would be my answer. Thank you, Travis. Charles, over to you. I understand why the question is being asked. Some people say he didn't take his, he didn't lose his salvation, he lost his joy. But in this passage, salvation is not positional. It's ma it's mainly the idea is this: is that Saul lost the kingdom. David is praying that he uh, is able to maintain his kingdom. The Davidic covenant, if I remember right, has not been given yet, and so he doesn't have that assurance or promise. And so it does relate to experiential sanctification as well as his responsibility and role as king. God bless. Thank you, Charles. Travis, question was for you. You get the a quick final word if you'd like it. Yeah, I, I think you think about what David did. He committed adultery. He, he took uh, Uriah, had him killed, lied about it, had a child out, out of adultery, and this free grace movement thinks that he don't even have to repent and he gets to go to heaven. And you wonder why Fox News is showing all these people killing people just like atheists. Atheists don't believe that in a God and the free grace say you can't go into hell once you believe. Okay, appreciate the last word there, Travis. Kevin's Biblical Discussions. Appreciate the Super Chat support and the question Question for Travis. Kevin is asking, if water baptism uh, baptism was a gospel issue, why is it not mentioned in passages that deal with salvation? Why didn't the Apostle Paul teach water baptismal regeneration? Uh, go ahead, Travis. Okay. Well, again, you are coming at the stance that you say um, it is not mentioned in passages that deal with salvation. Well, it depends on what, what you think is the passages that deal with salvation. Mark 16, 16 is a salvational passage, and that's Jesus. And you, and you state that in Acts 2, 38, Acts 22, 16, Galatians chapter 3, Romans chapter 6, 1 Peter 3, 21, Ephesians chapter 5, 1 Peter 3, 21. These are all baptism and salvation connected. And you said that Paul didn't... Paul, why didn't Paul teach baptism regeneration? Well, maybe you missed the first part. I don't teach baptism regeneration like the Catholics. Yes, you have to be baptized, but it doesn't somehow have mystical water and change your nature where you're born totally depraved or like original sin. So you apparently didn't listen. And then if you actually read what Paul uh, taught in Romans chapter 6 and Galatians chapter 3, Paul did teach baptism. Why did he teach baptism? Because Ananias told him to be baptized to wash away his sins. Thank you, Travis. Unless he froze there. Let me just double. If he did, we'll uh, wait a couple seconds, give him the opportunity to, to finish his thoughts as we wait. Kevin, again, thank you for the, the question and the support. We've got a lot of great input and questions from our uh Okay. Fantastic audience tonight. Me. Travis, you're back. You're back. I, we we I'm lost you. Anyways. Okay. Okay. Just wanted to wait for you to. Um, I did say um, he could call my, you know, he could call my program. I don't know if I cut out before I said that. Okay. Well, I appreciate it, uh, Travis. Charles, yeah. 
Uh, floor is yours. Yeah, since I view water baptism as experiential, uh, these other passages where it does mention salvation in them, I view those usually, typically, as experiential as well. So you would have to think about that relationship. Concerning the issue about baptismal regeneration, I'm not arguing the Church of Christ believe in baptismal regeneration. I believe that baptism, in their view, is experiential and that regeneration is positional upon the moment of belief. They don't have to believe like the reform that think you're regenerated in order to get a gift of belief and then you're saved. No, they believe in the efficacious power of the word of God that when it's preached, you can believe that promise of scripture for eternal life. The problem is, is that they don't believe the promise of eternal life after they fall into their system of false discipleship that says that they have to continue in, in baptism, faithfulness and all of that in order to maintain their salvation, not realizing that it's distinct from the fact that they believe the gospel. Thank you, Charles. Travis, you get the last word. Question was for you. Well, I think if you look at 1 Timothy chapter 1, uh, Paul says, How be it for this cause I obtain mercy that, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them that which should come after that believe on him to a life everlasting. So Paul actually said, so if you really want to know the answer, Kevin, for the time I have, you need to go watch Aaron Gallagher debate Trey because Aaron Gallagher goes into the conversion of Saul or Paul, and he does it so well, you would have to just be dishonest to, to accept what the Bible teaches, that Paul did teach baptism, my friend. Okay, thank you. And next question comes in from, we got a question for both. And so this one's from Stephen Brown. Thank you. Question for both. What must we believe about Jesus to be saved? Um, why don't we start with you, Charles, since Travis started with the last couple? I believe you could say the person, the provision, and the promise. You could say the person, the work, or the promise. In other words, the person being Jesus Christ is God, sin, the substitution, and sacrifice. His work at the cross is his provision that is the basis for that. And we're given the promise of eternal life that even though Jesus Christ died for the whole world and the sin, uh, the penalty for sin has been imputed uh, at the cross is not imputed to us. And Christ's righteousness imputed to us. Not all people that uh, uh, the people that do not choose to believe the gospel do not have Christ's righteousness and they don't have his eternal life. So even though he died for them, they don't have eternal life until they believe the promise of eternal life. Appreciate it. Uh, Travis, floor is yours. All right, just to make it kind of quick, oh, that's one thing about some questions are sometimes hard to answer so quick. But uh, what must we believe about Jesus? John 8, 24, I say unto thee that thou that ye shall die in your sins. If you believe not that I am, ye shall die in your sins. So you must believe, and the I am is referencing to Exodus chapter um, uh, 3, that he is deity. He is the son of God, not like a created angel or anything like that. So you must believe that he is the son of God. And in 1 Corinthians 15, it talks about referencing to the gospel. You must believe in the death, burial, and resurrection. So some of you that may ask about he, he, that, that excludes your argument right there, the death, burial, and resurrection. So see how that works? And you must believe about what Jesus taught. He taught of the kingdom, which is the church of Christ. And Jesus said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, Mark 16, 16. So uh, that's some of the key things that you must believe about Jesus for the time that I have. Thank you for the responses, uh, Travis and Charles. Next question comes in from Honesty Angel. And her question is for you, uh, Travis. Ephesians 2.8 says we are saved by grace, which means unmerited favor. If we have to be baptized to be saved, doesn't that mean the favor is merited? Okay. What this is, is you're begging the question. You're looking at it just because someone has to do something, they're earning it. They're meriting it. If you would read Joshua chapter 6, where it talks about how they actually had to circle the wall of Jericho, say they didn't earn it or merit it. It was a gift. And so Ephesians chapter 2 is not, it says, um, for by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works that any, anyone should boast. So we can't, even though we're required to be baptized, you can't boast about it because I didn't come up with it. 
see how that works? God is the one that come up with the plan. And Luke 17, 10 says, I'm just an unprofitable servant. I'm just doing my duty. So even though there's things that you have to do, even Charles says you got to believe. Well, who's doing the believing? Well, Charles would say you're doing the believing. Can you boast or brag about that? That's something you're doing. See, you are begging the question just because you have to do something, you're earning it. So that would be, I would, I would hope that you would actually go and look to, to Ephesians and see how they became Christians. See, he didn't know the conversion account, and you probably don't know it either. It's Acts 19, and then you read their mail. That'd be my answer. Thank you, Travis. Charles, over to you. Yeah, um, the distinction is between believe and be baptized. You know, if God made baptism the way the person to be saved, that would mean that you would have to do something in addition to believe. And so it, it, it would not it would not be merited either way. If, if, if God, the, because merited means you earn salvation. So if you can make the argument that baptism is grace, then it wouldn't be merited, you know? So that's what I would say about that. And so the thing to understand though, is that the belief is before the baptism in any way you look at it. So I can't see how bapt water baptism can ever be positional. Thank you, Charles. Travis, question was for you, if you want the uh, final word. Okay. Um, I, I still don't get like, Charles' argument always says positional or experiential. If I'm, I'm, if I'm, if I'm right on that, and that seems like to be his answer to every everything, and I just don't see how that is sufficient for a lot of people just to say, "Oh, it's experiential. Oh, it's positional." But when you look at the text, the text is connected to certain things like salvation, saved, and remission. And again, Ephesians two, read their conversion account. Oh, I think he might have uh, froze for a second, but usually right. the, the very cut off at you. Um, it, it doesn't look like you're cut off for that much. You're only cut off for like three seconds. So maybe if you wanted to reiterate your okay. last couple words. Well, again, Ephesians chapter two, I, I agree that there's there's nothing we can do to earn or boast or brag about. But for you guys, again, to think that baptism falls into that category you're begging the question when these people were actually baptized in acts 19 and they were baptized to have their sins washed away then paul writes this to them all right so that would be my answer okay appreciate it there and to the audience again lots of excellent questions coming in and um again travis you basically are on the hot seat because they're either all questions for you or a couple questions for both so um, appreciate you being a good sport. Next question comes in from Point of Defense with John Crawford. And John says, question for Travis. Can you name one passage in the Bible that lists your plan of salvation? I'm guessing. Look okay. the steps, believe, repent, confess, and be water baptized. Yeah, appreciate that question, John. I love you, John. Um, so it says, can you name one passage? <laughs> Well, I mean, through the beginning of this, remember how I played? He takes the sum of God's word. And again, you want one passage. Well, I showed a chart. See, God gave us a book. He didn't just give you one verse. I made a joke on Facebook saying, I'm going to come up with a faith-only Bible. I think he froze up again. Uh -huh. Okay, so, you're back, um, Travis. You're back. So I, I would show that chart again where you see the conversion account. And I think Acts chapter 2 pretty much shows uh, that they did believe, as Charles would agree, they were told to repent by implication. So you actually have to apply implication. All right. Matthew 10, 32, um, Romans 10, 9 and 10. We know, even though it's not stated, I mean, do you not have... I mean, are you not going to be honest about this, John? It doesn't even say Saul believed. Did he believe? Well, yeah, you, you, you like to use implication with your uh, theology, but not with the Bible. And so, I mean, I, you could use Acts 2.38. That would be my answer for you. I just Thank you, Travis, for that. John Crawford, thanks for the question. Charles, over to you. Well, 
he he's using Acts two thirty eight as his one passage. So let's just examine that. What what must we do? This implies they already believe. Doing implies experiential obedience. The statement about repent is related to experiential repentance. It's a plural word that refers to the responsibility for the nation of Israel. And then be baptized is a shift to the singular, which means that it's a parenthetical phrase. And the statement about for the remission of sins is tied to repentance. So what that means is that repentance is tied to remission of sins and not necessarily baptism in that particular passage. So even though it's all experiential, there's nuances within that. And as for the ace arguments and all of that, that's not a problem either way. And far as about quoting the Badag, that was uh, that was uh, manipulated by Lutheran guy that edited it. And of course, Lutherans believe in baptismal regeneration. So of course, they're going to put that into the text. And we could go into that if we want. There is no confession unless you say that what must we do is a confession of amendment. But, you know, if that's your one text, the problem you run to is this. There was no Bible passages at that point. You can only use that one text. You can't use any of your other system because for the first 10 years, that's all the Israelites had right there. They had the apostles and the prophets and teaching and stuff. So if you're going to be consistent, then just use a little bit of Acts and don't pretend like you got all these other verses that support your argument and you read it all in. But really, you're just basing everything off of Acts 238, just like you try to make the accusation about we're basing everything off of John chapter 316. However, I've already established that that's based on the compositional aspect of the whole entire book of the Gospel of John, not just one sliver of the book of Acts. God bless. OK, appreciate it, Charles. Question was for you, Travis. You get the last word. All right, again, um, can you name one Bible passage? In, can you name one passage in the Bible that lists your plan of salvation? You know what, John? I would ask, can you give one Bible passage from Genesis or Charles uh, in the review later on, but you guys won't answer this question. Give one Bible passage from Genesis to Revelation where it says we're saved by faith only. Faith only. I'll tell you what, if you find one where it says we're saved by Oh, a little bit of freezing there again. Um, your connection was basically great most of the time, but there must be some bandwidth issues just currently. Okay, Travis, you're back. Um, yeah, I'm back. Yeah, maybe reiterate okay. the last couple points you made there just so just so the I audience switched gets my, it all. I switched my Wi-Fi. I went from the 5G to regular. Maybe there's something with – because sometimes 5G has problems going through walls or whatever, but um, – I said, I'll write you a check if you can find one passage from Genesis to Revelation where it says we're saved by faith alone. And why I say that is a lot of you guys make these arguments, but you don't put your argument back on you. I think a good debater will learn to put the argument back on you. And if you don't even uphold your own argument, it's a bad argument. All right. That's my time. Okay, thank you, Travis. Next question comes in from the Apologetic Dog. Thank you very much for your question for Travis Thomas. And the question is, in Luke 5, the paralytic's sins were forgiven before he arose and picked up his bed. What works did the paralytic do to be saved? Go ahead, Travis. I think you might have. Is it? Am I still there? You're back now. So if you did say something over the last couple seconds, maybe try and uh, re reiterate it, Travis. Okay. Okay. Um, I said this is a good question because I asked this question in a debate with one of his members, and I asked in verse twenty. It says, "And when he saw their faith, he said unto the man, unto the unto him, man, thy sins are forgiven." So what they did. Jesus referenced it as their as their faith. So what this guy uh, Jeremiah, a Calvinist, he he actually needs to repent too. If you go on my YouTube, you can watch he lies and he doesn't even repent. So Calvinists say he would never save to begin with. But anyways, he says that um, the paralytic sins were forgiven before he arose and picked up his bed. What works did the paralytic do to be saved? Well, the, the Calvinist would say. You don't have to do anything, but that's not what the text, the text is actually saying the, the things they did, Jesus referred to. 
we'll wait for him to come back. Um, and I know uh, Travis has been on the Apologetic Dogs channel for at least one. Okay, Travis, you're back. And so I, was I just don't know getting... what is wrong with my internet. I apologize for that, but that's technology for you. That's okay. That's okay. All right. So I think I was, I was pretty much done, but it says, what works did the paralytic do to be saved? Well, we understand that his friends did most of the work. He was paralyzed, but it is a whole mutual of that group of what they did. And so when Jesus says he saw their faith, he actually saw their action. And I don't think that you would be referencing today that you can just sit at home, sit at home and not even hear the gospel and be saved. But that's kind of what it sounds like. You're just say, stating that you don't have to do anything today from this example. Appreciate it, Travis. Charles, whatever my, you'd like to add, my, go ahead. My initial assumption is the passage is about experiential sanctification and it's talking about temporal forgiveness. Remember, Israel underneath the Mosaic Covenant had certain violations and disciplines that in general principle related to the nation of Israel, but, but that didn't necessarily mean that each individual could be in some. But however, there are places in scripture that show that God can chastise an individual because of certain sins and stuff. So all that relates to the experiential temporal aspect of things. Thank you, Charles. Travis, you get the last word. All right. Luke 5, 18, and behold, a man brought in a bed uh, of a man which was taken with a palsy, and they sought means to bring him in and lay him before him. Again, these guys brought him in through the roof in verse 20, and when they saw their faith, they were doing something, and it was in referencing to their faith. Now, they didn't have a dead faith. They had a faith which worketh by love, and when Jesus saw their faith, he said unto him, Man, thy sins are forgiven. So unless you're thinking that your friends are somehow contributing to an individual who doesn't believe, this makes no logical sense that you're trying to, to use this verse. It would be like that if Charles had a child and he was 15 and didn't know nothing about the gospel, that somehow Charles's faith could, could be moved over to the child without him even doing anything. That's kind of the way you're presenting this. So I don't get it. Thank you, Travis. And again, to the apologetic dog, appreciate the question. Next one comes in from Eli Haytov. Thank you very much. And question for Travis. In 1 Corinthians 1, Paul talks about the power of the gospel to save. Why does he say in verse 17 that he was not sent to baptize, but to preach the gospel? Maybe, maybe uh, you can share this because I want sure. this question. I want them to be able to see this. All right. Yeah, there we go. All right, again, when you pick up a letter, you don't just start. I think the question started at verse 17, right? That's the question. The question says, For Christ did not send me not to baptize, but to proclaim the gospel or to preach the gospel. Look here. No person would just pick up their Bible and start right there unless they're preconceived. See, someone that doesn't want baptism to be required, they're preconceived. Because actually, if you look up, the issue is dealing with division in the Lord's church. And he says, now, now this I say that every one of you saith, I'm a Paul, I'm a Paulus, am I Cephas, am I a Christ? Notice this. Notice, listen to this. Is Christ divided? No. Was Paul crucified for you? No. Were you baptized in the name of Paul? So he's actually using baptism as an argument to show that it is required. That's why uh, he says, I thank God that I baptized none of you because of the division. It is required. You have, to have, you have to have Christ crucified for you, and you have to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, 1 Corinthians 12, 13. So this is just pulling a pretext out, jumping the gun, and thinking that this baptism is not required, but it is. Thank you, Travis. Charles, uh, just make sure to unmute and uh, feel free to have your response. Yeah, the intention of this passage is to talk about how there's divisions based on certain teachers or, or groups that are promoting certain teachers. 
one group saying they're of Christ, another saying of Paul, Apollos, that type of attitude like that. And so Paul didn't want to add to that schism. You see the same thing with John the Baptist's disciples and Jesus' disciples. They were in competition and they shouldn't have been because they were on the same team. So when we're talking about the issue of baptism, Paul does make a distinction that my focus was on preaching because when he's preaching, he's talking about the word of God. He's saying, look, I don't want to get caught up in your tit for tat thing wherever you think you put me down in the set or the gang that, that therefore you're a follower of me. He's saying, I focused on sharing the gospel. So you do have a distinction between the preaching of the gospel and the baptism, but it's not saying that the baptism was part of the gospel. And, and that's the important distinction that, that the intention of it has nothing to do with a, a saying that water baptism is part of the gospel. Appreciate it, Charles. Travis, get the last word. Well, when we actually have gospel meetings or we're preaching and, and we have maybe a guest speaker, we actually teach what the Bible teaches, that you do have to be baptized, but it ain't necessarily doesn't de depend on the preacher. See, that's what Paul is referencing here. You know, it doesn't matter who baptized you. It's what the individual knows. And so that's why he says that, because they were being carnal and they were following or putting these teachers up on a pedestal. See, that is the key of it. And that, and I would say the same thing. See, I believe baptism is required. But if you guys started being carnal and putting the teacher up on a pedestal, I would say the same exact thing. But if you actually read more writings of Paul, you'll see in Romans chapter 6, 3 through 9, Paul taught baptism. And he actually refers to it as the you obeying the gospel. And he refers to that the person who is dead is free from sin and you die in baptism, Romans chapter six. So, Okay, Travis, thanks for that final word. Next question comes in from Matthew Sneed. Question for Travis. How is the priest that was sleeping with his stepmother still saved? And he references uh, 1 Corinthians 5, 5 specifically. Well, there's several things with that. I don't know where he come up with with he was a priest unless he's referring to that we're all priests as far as Christians as Peter says so I don't really know either how he comes up with uh, he was still saved when the Bible says in verse 4 in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that means by the authority when you're gathered together at the assembly I added that but gathered together where else are going to be gathered at Walmart in my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, he says in verse 5, to deliver such a one unto Satan. Well, Charles says Satan's going to be in hell. So he's going to deliver this guy unto Satan. For what reason? Well, for the destruction of the flesh, his sin. It was so disgusting that the spirit may be. It doesn't say will be. Now, the King James says may be. And if you read the second letter, he actually repents. And he tells the Christians, hey, this guy repents. Hey, be easy on him. He is forgiven. So the Bible says he may be saved because we see the second letter, he repents. Very clear. Thank you for that question, though. Thank you, Travis. Charles, floor is yours. Yeah, and it doesn't say he's a priest, you know, but he's a believer. And it's talking about divine discipline, church discipline. Turning one over to Satan for the destruction of flesh means uh, excommunicating him, kicking him out of fellowship so that he could be underneath Satan's domain because Satan is the God of this world, the God of this age, and therefore he's not under temporal discipline. And so while he's by himself, he's thinking about the consequences of sin because he's not listening to the church and everything. And then far as about the statement about that it gives the purpose of the result that he may be saved, that's not talking about positional salvation. That's talking about being saved from temporal uh, uh, punishment and also saved in a sense of preservation for his purpose. Because if he does repent, if you will, or confess sin, get back in fellowship and serve the Lord, then he will be preserved in his purpose. And as for the connection about Second Corinthians, there was another letter written in between the two, and some say it's combined in Second Corinthians. It may not necessarily be the same person that was restored, but I don't have a problem saying he's restored. But uh, still, um, the passage is not talking about positional salvation. Thank you, Charles. Travis, you can have the final word. Okay. Well, 
First Peter 2, verse 9, it says, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. So I'm not for sure if this guy's referring to that. I'm a priest in the sense of that, as all Christians, members of the Lord's church, are Christians. But again, now, Charles is really good about reading the text and putting a lot of, of uh, his theology behind it. Now, the text says to deliver such a one unto Satan. Where's Satan going to be? Is he going to be in heaven? No, he's going to be in hell. This guy is going to be lost. For what reason? The destruction of the flesh that this guy was committing. Now, Charles actually says, yeah, you can sleep around with your mother-in-law. You could actually go ahead and have babies with them. See, and then you could kill them, and then you could eat them because you can't fall from grace. Just like the man who wants to go to hell to see his wife, he can't even go there. You are forced. You're kidnapped to go to heaven. That is this. And the Bible says that it, the spirit may be saved. Now, that's what the Bible says, may be. So thanks on that question, too. Thank you very much. And gentlemen, we are coming up uh, close to 35 minutes, actually, on the audience Q&A. So we've uh, we've tossed in some bonus minutes since we've gotten so many questions from the audience. And debate wise, we're coming up at three hours. So we're going to wrap it up here with the final question. I do appreciate uh, the time that our debaters tonight, Travis and Charles, have given us for this, what I would say is, is a debate to remember. So Clint Little, and it's a question for Charles. So we'll sneak one in for you specifically, Charles. Clint's coming at you. So feel free to respond as you'd like to. And he is, he's saying Jesus made things plain. For example, and he quotes Mark 16, 16, he, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. And so Charles, how would you like to respond? Yeah, well, number one, uh, Let's see if I have the caliber to go against Gallagher that was mentioned earlier, right? Because of my linguistic stuff and his claims for that. Second of all, you have to recognize there's a texture variant there. All right. So that deals with texture criticism. That's a complex concept. Third of all, you have the statement in context where the disciples were having doubts. And then it makes a special promise that he who believed and is baptized should be saved. And so it's a reference to those that enter into the Great Commission and are, are being preserved for their purpose. So it's not even necessarily positional in this passage. And so you have all of those factors that are involved in there. And then another thing you have to see is that the second clause says he that does not believe is not condemned. So just because you have a statement about baptism in there does not necessarily mention that because the other clause does not cancel that out. So those are all factors that have to do with the interpretation of that passage. And so you you think it's fancy words and language, but yet uh, what's uh, Travis brought up the badag. Travis has all that stuff as well. And so you can't go the humble road of lack of scholarship and then appeal to scholarship at the same time. So if you think you got the caliber, bring it on Gallagher or whoever you want. And let's see whose exegesis is correct. God bless. All right. Appreciate it, Charles. Uh, Travis, floor is yours. All right. When, when Charles was talking about the textual issues of Mark 16, 16, I have documentation showing there's proof that that is inspired. Uh, you shouldn't want to remove some of God's word and, and throw out, if, if we can't believe Mark 16, 16, what else can't we believe? Maybe we can't believe John 3, 16. That would really destroy their, their whole doctrine with that. Now, again, Jesus says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Now, I believe Jesus, and, and I'm just going to obey him. I'm not earning or meriting my salvation by simply obeying. And he says, the second part says, He that believeth not shall be condemned. I, I don't think anyone goes around getting baptized that don't believe. See, if if it says he that goes to Nashville and pays a hundred dollars gets a gets a new car. Well, if you don't go to Nashville, you don't even add the second part. It's not even I mean Jesus he's not preaching the gospel to kindergartners. We understand that that's a simple text. So I'm just gonna I'm just gonna simply say his excuse that's not positional or that's positional that's ex uh, experiential, experiential. That's his art. And you're a, you're a King James only Church of Christ, which is weird because when I did World Bible School, we used the NIV. Charles, you get the lot. Travis, you did kind of freeze up. I would say for the last three seconds. Okay, I just I just want to say I'm not King James only, Charles. 
then you said that you know that John 16, I mean, Mark 16 is inspired. Did you get special revelation from God that told you that it's inspired? Yeah, First Peter told me. First Peter is talking about all scripture, but it doesn't necessarily indicate that that's all scripture. What manuscript evidence are you basing your doctrine of scripture on? Well, I would have to dig into this to show that some of the manuscripts, it does show the end of Mark 16, 16, and it, and right. it has, it has other scriptures. It some, has manu other... some manuscripts, but it's a complex point, and that's what I was saying. So why all the fancy words and language? Because we need textual criticism. We need exegesis. That's my answer to Clint. Okay, Charles and Travis, excellent debate. We are going to wrap it up there. Again, it's definitely been a comprehensive one. It's been a very engaging one. And so I do want to thank, again, our debaters, Travis Thomas from Truth With Proof and Charles Jennings from the Layman Seminary for their time for this important debate on salvation. Let's get some final words and final thoughts, gentlemen before we completely uh, wrap it up for the night. Travis, let's start with you. Again, it's always uh, it's always nice having a new face here on the uh, on the channel. And so again, thank you. And some final words, final thoughts. Uh, I respect uh, Charles in many ways. I respect him as a person. I respect his soul. I love his soul. Uh, he has a zeal for God, uh, but I think it is not according to knowledge. Um, not saying that in a, in a disrespectful way, Charles. You put a lot of time and energy um, I just can't agree with you on this position because I don't think you brought forth biblical evidence. I do want to end on this. Well, you, I've never done this. Can you give me a fist bump? All right. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, last time I had a debate in person, uh, Tim and I, we actually we shook hands after the debate. We ain't going to be able to do that. You know, I don't even know what state you live in, but I uh, appreciate you guys having me on and uh, appreciate all the viewers. And I just really hope you know, and I would think that Charles would too, that you guys, some of you guys are very close minded and you've got to investigate. I mean, you guys, some of you guys are just saying, no, he's wrong. And you, and you don't even know fully the position and you gotta, you gotta take time and study. And I do have a live call in program. So you can call you guys in the chat, just say things and you run off. I want people to actually call me and you can call during my show and we bring up the Bible and we just talk like normal people. We don't have to be rude and cuss each other and talk over each other. And I sure can't out rap Charles. I mean, he's a, he's a rapper, but uh, that's it, man. Thanks for having me guys. All right. My pleasure, uh, Travis. Thank you so much for, for doing this. You know, that's what I love about these debates is we can come into these, we can come into them swinging while prepped and, you know, ready for a soteriology showdown. And at the end of the day, shake hands or fist bump. So that was great to see Travis again. Thanks so much, Charles. Uh, over to you. Thank you again for doing this. And before I hand it over to you, I see uh, Cheryl in the chat. She is advertising an after show. So there is a link in the uh, live chat for people to check out. Charles, I'm guessing the after show is on your channel. But uh, yeah, Charles, over to you. Final words, final thoughts. Yeah, um, I really enjoyed this debate with Travis. I like that he challenged the chart in PowerPoint format and just so much that he has to offer. I, I like how he got the Badag stuff at the end, you know, slipped that in. I look forward to him going into more detail on that stuff. I don't know anything about the debate polemics of Church of Christ or things like that and what how they use things. So that's all new to me. But what I do want to say is just as Travis understands that that we right here, we're doing martial arts. Right. But you can go to our dojos, whether it's Layman Seminary or Truth With Proof, and we can do more and more detail on things. This is just a brochure to what we have to offer. So if you like what we do, just check us out. And I know I can't win the meme war with Travis, and I'm not going to engage in a meme war. But whenever he puts something out that I feel that I can bring clarification to, or him vice versa, we'll keep doing that. And maybe some of the other guys the, the, that have the, the, the Gallagher for the caliber, or however you say that, if they eventually want to challenge me and I'll see you know, what my training and, and experiences do with, then that's fine. Because all I care about is truth and about the layman seminary. I want to always provide good debate preparation and good debate evaluation as a means for people to learn stuff that way. 
and be engaging. So thank you. God bless. Absolutely. Great final words from uh, the both of you, Travis and Charles. If you like what you've seen from the debaters tonight, please do check the uh, description box. You'll find the relevant links to uh, Travis's channel and also uh, Layman Seminary, where you can uh, engage them in their uh, dojos, <laughs> theology dojo. So with that, to the audience, thanks so much for tuning in. Appreciate all the support and uh, just a ton of questions that came in. So lots of fun in the audience Q&A. With that, uh, Donnie is out and God bless all.